welcome everybody to our board meeting today. It is being live streamed uh, and uh, we've got quite a long agenda today. Um, so I would appreciate that everybody who is introducing an item, if they can just keep to the key points, everyone should have read the papers so we can um, allow time for questions and make sure we cover everything um, adequately. Um, I have had apologies for absence from Hilary Gledhill and Michelle Hughes. Are there any other apologies, please? No? OK. Uh, declarations of interest. If there are any changes to declaration of interest, anybody wants to make known now or conflicts um, and any alterations, of course, to the Trust Secretary, Jenny Jones. Anybody want to change anything or declare anything? No, thank you very much. Uh, minutes of the meeting held on July the uh, uh, July, 27th of July 2022. Um, are there any corrections and can these minutes be approved? Any corrections? No. Are these minutes approved? Can I have a little indication, nods from everyone? Brilliant. OK, thank you so much. So let's move on to the action log and matters arising. Are there any things, any issues people want to raise to clarify or um? Uh, add to? No? Okay, thank you very much. They are uh, received. And now we move on a little bit earlier, actually, but I think we have our, our guests here um, for part of the staff story today. I think we have them here. So we can move on to that. And we have uh, Tracy uh, is going to, I think, say a few words. Tracy Flanagan, who's deputising for Hilary Gledhill today. Tracy is the Deputy Director of Nursing, Allied Health and Social Care Professionals. Uh, we have Thomas Tinash, um, uh, who is a practice nurse uh, with us today, and Donna Croak, who's a practice education facilitator. Now, I've got here Thomas Tinash Tom. Is that correct? Have I pronounced that correctly? Yes, it's um, correct. Thank you very, thank you very much. I'd just like to make sure I've got that right. And today's staff story is about the Overseas Nurse Recruitment Programme, which we have discussed at board before um, and had regular updates on what is happening. And it's great to sort of hear from people who are directly involved in that uh, today. So over to you. Tracy, are you going to say a few words or are we going to go straight to Donna or Thomas? Uh Thank you, Chair. Just to say, it's just a, a delight to introduce Tom and Donna today. I was lucky enough to meet the first cohort in Hornsey a year ago, so I'm really looking forward to sharing Tom's story with you today. Now, I'll hand over to Donna and Tom. Thank you. Tracy. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us today. Um, my name's Donna Groak, and I'm newly into this comment for international nurse recruitment. So I've played a really small part in Tom's story, so I won't take up too much of his time. Um, just, just to say for myself as well that um, I'm joining the year on from that first cohort landing in September. So it is really building on the successes of um, placing the 18 overseas nurses across the divisions in the trust. So yeah, looking towards that sustainable sort of longevity of the international recruitment pathway. So here's Tom, um, I'll hand it over to you, Tom, and tell us a little bit about your experiences through that international recruitment pathway. And he's really open to questions as he goes. So over to you, Tom, thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. And good morning, everyone. Um, Thomas Tom, uh, Thomas Tinashe Tom, I'm here part of the board just to share my story as one of the international nurses. So, as you all know, I'm part of the pioneer international nurses which were recruited by HAMBA last year, September. So it's a year now in the trust. Originally, I'm Zimbabwean, but when I was recruited, I was recruited from Namibia. That's where I was working, and but I practiced my nursing. I stayed there for 16 years. I've been a nurse now for 18 years, the 12th being in Africa and one in the UK. So now I'll say I've got 18 years experience as a nurse. For my training, I did study at the University of Namibia, where I got a qualification in Diploma in Comprehensive Nursing, Science and Midwifery. It was a four-year program. So after completing that, I went and I practiced in Namibia where I was working at a GP practice. 
So for 12 years, I, I went to the GP practice where I worked as a nurse. And then later on in my career, I, I, I ended up working as a registered nurse and as a practice manager. So I had two roles that I used to do before I came here. And it was of a privilege that I did my UK process and then I got a job in Hamba Teaching Trust. So initially when I was recruited, I was supposed to work at Mountain District Hospital. But from what I said earlier on, you can see most of my experience was working in the community. So I thought it was a community hospital, I could handle that. But through the trust being flexible and through also part of the international team, I told them my challenges and my concerns. So I ended up being posted at a GP practice, King Street Medical Center, where I've been working since December last year. So moving on further, my I'm currently working at King Street Medical Center, where I'm working as a trainee practice nurse. Now you'd be wondering, I'm a nurse already, but why is a trainee? It, it's just the system. When you come to the UK, if you are working in a GP practice, you have to be a practice nurse. So now it's a part of consolidation of what I know and what I can bring to the trust. So that's also one thing which I'm grateful for from the trust. You know, when somebody's joining a new organization, you think while you are still doing your probation, you can't be given a developmental role or something to study further. But that was different in my case, because from day one, when I started working, I was already offered a developmental role to train as a trainee practice nurse, which is a 16 months program, which I'm grateful about that, which I'm already halfway through. So at least something positive, right? And in this role, I've achieved so much. I've managed to complete some courses, like I did my asthma diploma, immunization, COPD, travel, and currently now we are going in the winter season, so we are busy with the immunization program, which I'm also grateful that I'm now part of and part of that, and I'm still trying to develop my career further on. And also the other achievements that I have Managed so far is to finish my preceptorship, you know, the whole program. It was a six months program so that I can acclimatize myself from the nursing practice in the UK, which I completed. And also, the other achievement that I have completed so far is I was selected to be part of the NHS International Nurse Recruitment Team, where they had to choose people from all over the NHS in, the, in, in England where they had to go and share their stories in London. And I was one uh, chosen among the rest of international nurses. So I had a trip which was funded to go to London for a day in a photo shoot and also share my story. So I'll be, there'll be some posters coming out soon. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, 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 during that experience, I felt like a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> and the other achievement, which is a personal achievement, I, I've achieved, you know, I've been in the UK now for a year and I pat myself on the shoulder that I ended up not being a prodigal son. Just to share more light, when I came here with my previous role, I used to work at a GP practice, and for some reason, I used to work for my dad, and I was a practice manager. So everyone used to think that I wouldn't adopt or adjust to be in the UK and stay for so, so, for so long, but I'm seeing myself going strong, and it's also because of the team that I'm working with at the GP practice. It makes me feel like family. It's more like a continuation of the role that I used to do before. So I'm seeing myself progressing far. I know sometimes, you know, people say I'm over ambitious, but I always tell myself the sky is the limit. One has to aim for the sky, you end somewhere, right? So I'm currently taking my role to be a practice nurse. After that, I don't see myself as a practice nurse. I think I should develop further. I might be a Ben 7 nurse doing prescribing. And if times comes, 
it won't be the last time you seeing me on this board. I might be seated among the whole board. You, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And also, I'm also grateful, you know, when I came as part of the international days, the contract that we signed and the trust has been helping us throughout. I remember the first time when we came, you know, it's, it being in a new environment, it was also a bit difficult to settle in and to get our accommodation advice. The trust has been helpful. We managed to get places to stay because, you know, you need to have a history here, but the trust assisted in that. And also, as international nurses, you know, when you come, you have to do like an OSCE examination. So initially, first, the trust was supposed to pay for the first part of the exam. But us being pioneers, it so happened half of the group didn't make it, but the trust eventually changed the, the procedure and they ended up paying for everyone who didn't make it. So that's something which I've been enjoying in the trust and also the years of experience that we have, you know, coming to the UK with 12 years of experience, you'll be thinking that when you come, you are starting afresh but the trust also consolidated the years of experience that we're having. So my years of experience were, didn't go to West. I think that's about me in a nutshell for now. Thanks very much, um, uh, Thomas, for sharing that. I'm sure colleagues have got a number of questions. I think it was interesting um, how you, you ended there with the saying that, you know, obviously your years of experience were taken into account, but more opportunities to learn the systems we have here so you can make progress as well, which is really good to hear. And, and I was interested about what you said about support, you know, when you came here with accommodation and, and other matters, because that's important as well to make sure, you know, that everything is successful. Have you got any thoughts about any improvements or changes uh, that could further sort of enhance the opportunities and the sort of the settle the settling in for people coming from overseas. Okay, for for that, for in the time when you came, it was a bit different. You know, it was during the time of the pandemic. That's where you had the whole quarantine process and the likes. But I would think for people who have family, the trust should be in a position to assist for them also when they are coming through with their family, so that they can also when they are doing their OSCE examination and when they have the family here, they will be more settled. Yes. That's really helpful to know. Thank you. Um, I can see Lynn. Thank you. Good morning, Thomas. I'm Lynn Parkinson. I'm the um, Chief Operating Officer with the Trust. So fantastic to hear your story. You are so positive um, about it as well. Um, I'm particularly pleased that you're working within our primary care service. So my question, um, Thomas, and it sounds like, which is fantastic, that you've got aspirations for the future, including um, being at this board, um, which is, is, again, fantastic to hear. Where you are now, given that you, um, you know, you've brought all that experience clinically with you, um, which you have described, but obviously we would want um, Thomas to attract more staff um, across all of our services. But my question is particularly about primary care. Is there any more that we could do to support you from your experience or um, staff in the future, particularly in, in primary care, clinically around, you know, what would make it sort of attractive for other people to come and work um, um, from overseas in primary care specifically, if you don't mind? Oh, OK, uh, what I would think, you know, what would be more attractive for people to come and work more in primary care. One thing which I have learned so far through my experience here, the, the next thing that we're doing in Africa, you would be working like an advanced next practitioner. But once the moment when you come here, you need to have evidence so that you can start working as an advanced next practitioner. So with the staff which are coming through, if they are know that they can be offered this learning process, like the developmental roles that will also attract them because you are not just being stagnant, right? That's also something which I have realized. What I know now I'm consolidating to what I knew before. Like at the moment, 
also in the in in, in the GP practice which I'm working, the stuff is very helpful. They even because I finished also my travel health again. I was also given a role so that I can be part and lead of the travel health. So, which is something, you know, when you've got something going on, on your side, you would want. In my previous role, I used to do circumcision. So now I've got a department where I know I'm doing something that I can do on my own with the support, with the staff. Thank, Thank you, you. Thomas. It might be a conversation we could pick up outside of the board. Um, and, and maybe I can support with what you've just described us. But thank you for that. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Lynn. I've got uh, Michael next. Dr. Michael Dazar. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, Tom, I think you, you, what you shared is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, more so because I think I'm, I'm almost uh, seeing you as our uh, trust ambassador for international recruitment as one of them. Yeah, uh, because we're going to very soon be embarking on uh, hopefully uh, international recruit for, for medics as well. So I think uh, what, what you've just said over the last five, 10 minutes is I think uh, something we would like to kind of take it a bit further. So I'll, 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 I'll hope to contact you outside the trust board and you know um, hear from you so that we can share it with, with uh, the prospective candidates who want to come. But thank you so much for sharing this with the, with the board. And, and I think all kudos to you to come and talk in front of strangers and, and uh, say that uh, you had a very positive experience, which is, which is really good. And I think makes, makes us feel proud that we have done something really right. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Dean. I, uh, thank you, uh, Caroline, and thank you, Tom. Um, you, you said, I think, at the start of that, that you felt a bit like a, a celebrity, and I certainly felt I was in the presence of a celebrity because your your charisma and your enthusiasm and your energy just really shines through, even in this virtual meeting, and that's great to see. And I just agree with uh, with Michael, really. That, uh, that enthusiasm uh, is just really reassuring for the board in terms of how you've been welcomed into the organisation. It was also great to hear you just talk about your continuous professional development really and the importance of that and you wanting to continue to develop uh, into the future and I'm just checking really whether your your colleagues are um, similarly infused about that professional development and how can we help people in that continuous development uh, often we can bring people into an organization but we also want to help people move up the organization as, as you sure clearly want to do Yes, um, we've, I still communicate with my colleagues. I think they are also in the process of trying to apply some certain courses so that they can develop themselves further because I think they've seen maybe some of us, we are over ambitious, but for you to, to be someone, you have to, to progress in your career, right, so that you can make it. So I'm really grateful for the developmental roles and the places that we have so that we can advance further just to consolidate on what we know from before. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Hanif. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think my, my question is really for Donna, but before I do, I, like colleagues, I just want to congratulate Thomas. Uh, breath of fresh air listening to you, to you this morning. Uh, and, and Donna it really touches upon the point Dean's just made about Thomas is just totally inspirational and you can just see that enthusiasm coming across and hopefully living up to NHS England's expectations that he'll have NHS as his destination of choice. But, but it was more about colleagues in, in terms of both retention and sustainability and how we might actually use Thomas's experience to, to replicate it, because we've had a number of discussions at this board meeting around the challenges that we're going to be facing over coming years. Um, but is there anything we can take from Thomas's journey and cascade that uh, across our wider international recruitment? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I should have started with the disclaimer. I'm brand new to the purse, so I'm learning from all the expertise. I joined last week, uh, two weeks ago, so I'm soaking up all the expertise around me. But what came before this secondment was preceptorship for me, and I think that for me is that start of that CPD pathway. So the robust preceptorship around our new starters, especially, and ensuring that we've got different levels of progression. So we have sort of that shop floor clinical level getting everyone practice ready to go and then looking at that progression beyond preceptorship. So how we then look at um, supporting journey into research, education, that sort of clinical, the quadrant that we've got um, for development in the 
in the trust and utilising sectors of the trust for observation and shadowing opportunities for staff that that might not have sort of been aware of what might go on in um, certain divisions and sectors and giving them sort of opportunities as well to see what other roles are out there for development. So yeah, definitely we try and jump on the back of that sort of momentum of learning from preceptorship and go with that. Um, sorry, I've got Michelle, but Tracy, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, just just to sort of um, reinforce what Donna's saying and, and some of what Tom said about seeing Tom as an individual with a particular clinical background and expertise that we wanted to exploit and support him to consolidate and develop further. So being able to tailor our op offers to our international recruits that reflects what they've already done and, and to reflect the expertise that they're bringing. Um, but then to just echo what Donna said, we're a really diverse trust. There is a, a massive range of opportunities that we can offer to our international recruits. And I think it's really important to look at how we create um, the wherewithal for them to see and understand what opportunities are, are available to them in, in different clinical areas and then to support them with that continuing professional development pathway that will lead on from their preceptorship. Um, and I think it is that balance between creating opportunity, but also understanding um, the importance of that pastoral support, which, which Thomas talks about, you know, that feeling that he's got a family at work is, is so important. I'm guessing, Thomas, and, and the support that you've got from your colleagues around your professional development, but also that you are settled well and you know that you, you, you fit in and you've got a team around you that care about you. So it's, it's, it's thinking about those two things, the opportunities that we can provide, but also the, the quality of that pastoral support, which is critical. Um, and I think Thomas has articulated both those things really well. So definitely lots we can learn from your experience. Thank you, um, Thank you, uh, Tracy. Uh, Michelle, and then yeah, Stuart. Yeah, th thanks, Thomas. Good to, good to see you again, and what a great way to start the board, and it's great to hear. Just building, I'm not going to repeat everything, but but certainly the CPD, the continuous development, is really, is really, really important, so continue to do that. And I did actually, I did have a little, a little giggle, but in a positive way about the comment about you can that being over ambitious. Never be, never say that you can, you know, that you're going to be too over ambitious. I think it's really important that, you know, you do that. And and I, I've been a practice nurse and I'm a nurse by background, so hopefully you will be sat at our board at one day. So keep 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 at it. And 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 I think we've got, I've got a lot of a lot of diversity within the organisation in relationship to services, skills, etc. So continue to build on that and never stop learning. I don't stop learning either. So so that's great to hear. Obviously, we do need to keep feeding in about when things aren't going as well and how we can continue to do that because it's a really important transition, isn't it, to come in from, from an, in, in an international way into another organisation and an environment as well. So let's keep that feedback going. But I won't repeat what my colleagues have said, but it's great to see you. Great way to start the board. Continue that ambition. Please do not ever say that you you know you can never be too ambitious we need you know you need to continue to do that and if there's anything we can do to continue to drive and support that then please let us know and keep and keep that communication going because we're only as good as the conversations that we have um, and just finally welcome Donna I look forward to working with you lots of things ahead in relationship to international recruitment but great way to start the board so thank you very much but uh, Tom Thomas thank you thank you Michelle Stuart yeah, good morning, everyone. Hi, Tom. I'm Stuart, one of the non-executives, uh, really, like others, fascinated by your story. I I'm a big fan of um, international exchanges of all sorts of kinds. And I'm. my question really is about thinking about your experience in Africa. And I think you said you mainly practice in Namibia. What, 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 what would you observe about the way we do things here in Humberside in the UK, where you think, actually, the way we do it in Africa, in Namibia, is actually a bit better. What could we learn <laughs> from you? Have you got a general observation about our attitude to health or the attitude of our staff or, or anything of that vein? Oh, that's put you on the spot. <laughs> OK, <clears throat> let me just answer to that. You know, it's different organisations, right? While I was doing my nursing in Namibia, I was working in a private entity. So now I'm coming to a public entity. So you would see one thing about when you are in the GP practice, we work on a booking system. But for me, I don't really agree with the booking system. You can book something which is chronic, but you can't book something which is acute. I can't book that I'm going to have an 
acute tummy ache, right? You need to be seen then. If I get an appointment, like in three days' time, I'll be fine the time when that appointment comes to. So I would greatly like to have, like in the GP practice, where you have so many slots where acute problems can be dealt with. Yes. Chronic can wait, but acute needs to be dealt with. That's very interesting. Thank you. That's, re that's really helpful. So I'm just um, checking. I can't see any more hands up. Um, and uh, so I just want to say thank you, um, Thomas. Thanks, Donna. I think I, I, I will put your practice on my 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 lip visit list. I think, Tom, uh, Thomas, on a day that you're there, I think I have to make sure that that happens. Um, but it is it is great to see you. I just wanted to just um, ask just one quick question, maybe to Tracy or maybe even Steve. Are there any are there any sort of national issues or policies in terms of because there's all things to arrange visas. Obviously, there's family members as well. Is there anything that we should be aware of that we, you know, we need to sort of push up the chain, if you so to speak, nationally to say this could make it easier for uh, the NHS to recruit, not just us, but other parts of the NHS from our own experience? So from, from my point of view, I don't know if Steve wants to come in further, but I think NHS England obviously initially did a lot of work in, in terms of looking at how we smoothed that process and making sure that we've got um, processes in place around visas and around um, with the the use of agencies who have got all of those processes fairly slickly sort of established um, to make sure that we're, we're, we're not creating any undue anxiety or disruption or delays for, for our recruits, most importantly, so that their experience is seamless and, and, and smooth. I guess because we're recruiting from a number of different areas, there are different considerations with, with each of the areas that we're um, we're looking to recruit from and some of the the sort of the, the local arrangements and, and agreements about the recruitment processes have changed in the time that we've been doing recruitment so we've we've sort of um in some areas there um the, the commitment to allowing overseas recruitment has been withdrawn because of local pressures so it's then how we manage as well expectations on on both sides and and you know most critically thinking about that experience for for our international recruits and their families. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else, Steve, you, you from a sort of HR and a, a you know process point of view you would want to add. Um, I think we've, we've profited from that sort of like um, NHS England and the experience of some of the um, resource finders. Um, I think we've also learned a lot locally as an organisation and as a system um, that, that we've shared across the system to help us ensure that we're getting it right um okay okay thank you so, just, steve i can't see yeah, just, steve. I, yeah. thanks tracy i think you've covered most of it i, I guess I, I think in answer to your question caroline i think it's got a lot better in the last two to three years as as tracy's described and i think nhs uh england uh an improvement of help with that so process wise i think that's better i think there's always going to be an ethical conversation that you have about where you take your nurses from uh you know from from certain countries uh absolutely promote this and see this as part of their uh, their economy and i think that's fine and that's where the partnerships and that's where we're working with those partnerships i think where uh, I guess a more moral, ethical conversation comes in some trusts that have gone into countries, maybe where it's, um, you know, taking from their resources and leaving them with a problem. But that's not something that we've gone. We've not looked at that. We've gone with the, the countries that are supportive and part of the NHS programme. Brilliant. Well, that's good to hear because there's some things we can do, but some things nationally, it's the policies there, isn't it? that uh, obviously affect what we're, we're enabled to do. Um, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, I look forward to meeting you um, in, in the practice one of these weeks. And Donna, um, uh, uh, look forward to meeting and hearing from you as well as you get settled into the role. But that's really great. And thank you for joining us this morning, all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks all. See you. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. OK, that was great. That was really helpful and insightful um, and good to hear. So we'll move on now to item six, which is my report. Now, there is a paper with my report today, which um, really just outlines some changes uh, to the committee uh, membership um, going forward. And this has been discussed with all the non-executive directors uh, and Michelle as well. So I think there's hopefully no, no problems with the paper as it stands. As I've mentioned in the report, um, 
I appreciate that in some situations um, it will be difficult maybe for people to make the changes going forward from now. So what I've said within the report, subject to any conflicts with existing subcommittees and times and dates, um, uh, people can work out what's um, what's appropriate. But hopefully this will be fully up um, by January uh, 2023 for the uh, forthcoming uh, year. It obviously takes into account that Philip Earnshaw has joined us and he's very welcome and and he'll be taking up. Obviously, he already has, I think, chair of the quality committee. But again, I think we've tried to take on board some of the points that people have made just to highlight as well that um, we've added um, another non-executive director to the collaborative committee as well. So it might be that we might have to update the terms of reference for that at some point. And again, that was to make sure um, that we had adequate cover as well as having adequate input into that particular meeting. And I think that was one of the issues from the well-led review as well, which was mentioned too. So that was a task that we had to uh, resolve. So I hope that um, uh, everyone is um, happy and we can get this into working practice going forward. Mike. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy with this. Um, all the energies have been consulted and my diary is clear enough to be able to accommodate things straight away. Uh, there was just one minor query that I, I've already raised um, with, with the, uh, and that's regarding mental health alleged that the terms of reference only require two non-exec directors. So I understand that you're willing to consider that, um, but, but that I think needs to be done really quite quickly because um, with me and a new non-exec, with all respect to Phil Earnshaw, um, in terms of governance, it puts a lot of pressure on me to be able to spot any technical details or whatever. So if I could just leave that to be uh, to be considered, please. Yes, thanks very much, Mike. And thanks for uh, flagging that up to me beforehand. Yeah, let me take that away and do that. I mean, clearly it was an inherited terms of reference that there were only two NEDs on that committee. But I think, you know, it's worthwhile having a look at that. Um, and just to sort of flag as well, I mean, um, I've... Most of our non-executive directors are actually on chairing a committee and, and in total each of them are on four committees and the only difference is that are Philip and uh, Hanif who is of course associate director. So again let me take that away and also discuss it with Michelle as well about making sure we have the right capacity. Thanks Mike. Um, any other questions on the committees? No, just to say I've uh, recently done a visit to Newbridge's inpatient unit and was up at Whitby Hospital um, with Michelle, actually, where we had the um, long service awards. But also it was great to go back, actually, uh, and, and go around the hospital again and meet some of the staff again to see how things have embedded in there um, and uh, was able to go to the Magpie Cafe afterwards in the afternoon and have a nice um, moderate fish and chip uh uh, afternoon tea so that was great too so that was a lovely visit and um, and I just want to also just mention that the Governor Development Day recently we had which was thank you to uh, non-executive directors and members of the EMT who supported that uh, we had a really good discussion on how the trust audits itself and also on the collaborative committee and how that works and we also had a really good discussion and Q&A on um, uh, the um, issues around waiting times, which we discuss at this board every time we meet for children and young people accessing assessment for autism, ADHD, but also some of the issues within the neuro neurodiversity services for children and young people as well. So um, thank you to everyone who took part in that. And just finally, before I move on to Michelle, just to say this is National Inclusion Week. Uh, for those watching in, you can see our backdrop has that mentioned on it. I hope you can see that from your screen. Um, there's a whole series of events going on and I was really pleased to see every day there's a different way to action and it's really accessible in that if you know if you haven't got time as a staff member um, to go to a meeting, you can click on and see some things that can tell you about inclusion and what it might mean for yourself and your teams and your patients. And really, it's about everyone feeling that they've got a place, that they're respected, that they're being heard. Um, and uh, and that's really in, in line with the values of our trust. And uh, and and our chief exec has done a, a little video blog. I've written a blog for the end of the week. But yeah, you can just tap in each day on your emails and find out something that you can do. And I very much recommend if you get the chance to do that. Thank you. Um, Mike. 
Uh, yeah, you, when you were talking about the visits, Chair, it, it just struck me that but two things. First of all, Tracy and I visited Maester, uh, Maester Court yesterday, a five-bedded inpatient unit. Fantastic unit and really encouraging to, to think of the way that that unit and its next door working together and, and about the plans that they've got to, to cut travelling time and things for other parts of the service really encouraging so that that brought me on to another thing sorry to surprise you with this but in terms of accountability and and the governors and calling us to account might it be an idea that within your chair's report not only you but the non-execs list any visits that they've done so that the public can see that we do get around and we do do things um, i'll just float that as a kite and see what happens uh, thanks, Mike. Happy to take that away. I'm ha happy to group all the visits that are done um, between board meetings and have that there for, you know, um, uh, transparency as well. And um, and just to flag again, Katie Colrain and Kerry Nelson are working both with NEDS and governors with a forward plan of visits going forward too. And that's, um, um, I think that's ready to fly. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, but I know they're doing a lot of work on that at, at the moment. But thanks, Mike. I'll take that away. Okay. Right, we'll move on then to uh, Michelle, your report, Chief Exec. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you will have had a chance to read the report. Um, uh, covers a lot as usual. I'll pick a few headlines out, but then I'll open it up to questions. I'll keep it very short because of time. Obviously, we've got a policy in there in relationship to safeguarding children, so we'll come back to that at the end, I would suggest. Um, a little bit on there about the internal audit recommendations, which was significant assurance, which was good. A couple of minor issues in relationship to declarations of interest and conflicts, which has been picked up by Jenny, and I thank Jenny for doing that. And later on in the report, Report, they just gives you an update on the Grant Thornton work, which is more or less all completed, and we'll look at embedded nature of that as we go through the rest of the year. Um, just to flag up to the the, the the board, obviously I'll continue my, my visits. I'm not going to go into those because I do lots and lots of visits, both virtual and in person. Again, Mike, I've also been to the Maesters and it's fantastic to see that unit up and running and working really well. Um, but just to give some heads up to the board, I'm doing a lot of national presentations uh, over the next few weeks, um, which is really great for the organisation. So you, you may see, see my name on, not on billboards and searches and posters, literally. Um, I won't scare anybody to death in relationship to that, but a lot from um, health service journal from international uh, the integrated summit integrated care summit there's a couple of provider collaborative summits and then at the nhs providers national um, annual re re um, um, conference in november um, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the organization as well as the icb so if people want to have a look at the presentations i'm more than happy to share the slides when they're completed but there's a lot going on in the next few weeks um there's a great report in relationship to winter pressures and challenges um, and, and also COVID. We've linked all that together. Um, and there's also quite a lot of detail, which I will draw your attention to in the Director of Nursing report, which I'm sure Tracy will be happy to answer a bit more detail, which is about the new framework for patient um, response, incident responses. That is a significant national change to how we look at and report um, serious incidents in the future. There is a lead in time, which is great. A lot of the work we're already doing, which is that open approach involving service users and families but there is a substantial change there all of that will go through the quality committee but the final products will come to the board so so please do have a look at that and um, lots on cpd so it's picking up what thomas was saying earlier on there's a, a detailed piece in relationship to that and just to remind the board that the governors are involved in the place um inspections that are currently taking place that will conclude usual time around november Lots in there for comms. I know Michelle normally does a little bit on comms. I'm not going to spend too much time in it. Again, it's in the report. Very busy time for communications anyway. We've got a few openings. Obviously, we've got the annual members meeting next week, which I'll encourage uh, the public listening to please come to. It's a great time to meet some of our staff. We've got market stalls there where you can interact with some of our staff from primary care all the way through to our um, inpatient units as well. Um, so please, there's several um, different programmes ongoing. We've got the celebration event at Whitby next week um, alongside the AMM. And we've also got the awareness sessions, which I've asked them to include in the board report, just to give you a bit of an idea around what we're covering both internally as well as nationally and regionally. And then there's a the usual health stars update. Again, busy time for health stars. Uh, please have a look at the Whitby Brick. If you've not bought a Whitby Brick, it's a bit for you to, to have a little 
place in, in the, the memorial aspect of Whitby Hospital. Uh, buy a brick, put your name on it or whatever you want to put on within reason and the money goes to charity. So I'll leave you to think about that. But I might be asking what um, who has been participating in brick purchase um, a bit later on in the year. Lots of in the report from the directors at chair on the board. I'll leave it open to questions. I hope that was OK and not too rushed, but I'm conscious of time. Thanks very much, Michelle. What, um, are there any other members of the EMT who want to add anything? And then we'll open it up to, que to questions. I'm looking around EMT members. Nope. OK. Oh, Lynn. Sorry, I couldn't get the hand written. Um, just on the operation on the COVID report, um, obviously I won't um, rehearse again what's in there. It does connect, as Michelle says, to the winter report that's on the agenda later. Um, there is a little bit of an upturn in um, COVID um, infection rates. So we have a current situation of nine positive um, COVID patients within our inpatient beds and our numbers of staff um, absent with COVID has risen a bit as well. And there is an expected um, upturn in um, infection rates anyway, expected towards the end of October, beginning of November. So just to raise it here that we are obviously watching that, monitoring it um, very closely in terms of impact on services. And that element of the report does um, provide further information around the updated guidance, particularly around testing of asymptomatic staff and patients, which has obviously changed since um, the board last met. Um, so it's just to highlight those issues. The other bit that I would um, bring attention to, because it was discussed when the Humber Youth Action Group came to the board some while ago, and that's the development work on the um, children and young people's um, transitions and the CAMS passport. So um, just, just good to see that that has been developed and it has been co-produced um, with the action group, which is which is really positive. Um, Lynn, your 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 sound is really crackly. I don't know yes. if everybody else is hearing that. Uh, you might need to go out and come back in again. Um, uh, yeah, it's a. Well, I'll do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's nothing to do with you personally. It's the technology. Um, okay. Thanks for that, Lynn. Right. Let me look at colleagues who'd like to make some comments. Francis and then Mike. Thanks, Chair. And one, one of them, although she's gone now, was to pick up on the, the passports. But a couple of comments, a couple of questions. The, the first one was within Lynn's section on COVID and the discussion around um, CAMS uh, high demand. A lot in the press at the moment, a lot on TV about uh, problems with children and the pressure and the mental health. I was just wondering if somebody could, could give us an update on that. I'll, I'll, I'll pull them all out and then people can pick them up. I was wondering what the uptake was on the Shiny Minds app. That all looks great. Just wondering what the uptake was on that. Um, on the the passports, it sounds like great work. I think we've probably heard enough from that online, but it just sounded like great work, and I wanted to say that. And then finally, two other bits. One one was around the pay award and how people have, have reacted to the fact, obviously, that there's been a, a bit of less take-home pay for, for a group of people temporarily. And then the appraisal stuff, some great work there. And it'll be really interesting to see the, the report at Workforce when it comes through. Thanks, Francis. Who'd like to pick up on um, those points from Francis? Thanks, Steve. Do you want to pick up some of the, 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 the comments and, and, um, or Pete in relationship to the pension piece? Pete, I think Pete's got his. Is, Pete. is, is that OK? Sorry, Pete. Yeah. Yeah, so if I could with the pay award while we wait for Lynn to come back. So it was primarily people who were at bottom of scale on a band 8A were affected by this. And the, we modelled there were 67 people affected in the trust. I wrote to all 67 people to tell them what the impact was and to make an offer of an advance that would be repayable over the remaining six months. Most of the responses they got back were positive. They understand it was a national uh, rules we have to abide to. Thankful of the offer. Obviously, disappointed by it but then when we continue the dialogue in terms of the pension rules change again from October and actually it's a you know it's an unfortunate glitch in September that they go from 9.3 to 12 and a half percent but then when they drop back to 10 in September October sorry they kind of understood it and accepted it so you know some discontent but mostly people were supportive of the offer we put out there and I think as a trust we probably I mean Steve weren't coming on this I think we led this we were trying to get a national response to this to try and get an ICB approach to this N you know not very successful in either front so we took a decision at EMT and shared that and I think the ICB have now followed our lead on this so I'll stop there chair 
Thanks. Um, thanks, Pete. I think it was really proactive to help people cushion that sort of glitch as you described it as well and, and proactive. Um, anybody else want to come in? Is Lynn back with us to deal with the CAM situation? Lynn, you might have heard the point I made. I just said that in your report, you talked about the uptick in cams. And I was just saying there's been a lot recently in the press and on TV. I just wondered where we were with that, because it obviously is a problem for young children and young adults. Yes. Can you hear me OK now? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Disconnected the VPN. Um, Yes, Francis, what we're actually seeing is in terms of referrals, our referrals have actually plateaued now for CAMS, which is good. But what we are still seeing is that increased acuity complexity um, of the group that we are seeing. So um, obviously, I think we are in a... In, We've obviously introduced the, um, the home-based treatment service into CAMS, um, our crisis services there. Um, we are, um, with some winter funding, about to um, open again the children's safe space. So um, I think we're doing all that we can to um, manage that complexity of need, um, avoid hospital admission where it's appropriate to do so. Um, we do have a proposal that I've referenced in the report as well that hopefully we can operationalise quite quickly, which is a new day <laughs> treatment facility, um, particularly to support those patients and young people with eating disorders, because that's really where we are seeing as well that in... Um, um, demand and um, complexity still prevailing. Um, some of that, I think, is a direct consequence of the um, impact of COVID um, that we're still seeing. But there is a lot of work that we continue to need to do. It's a priority in the system. Francis, you know, we are seeing those children um, in um, local authority residential placements, you know, that the provider market is quite difficult at the moment. And we are seeing some crisis presentations as a consequence of that. So it's a conversation, discussion, priority, um, that certainly I and Michelle um, are involved in on a very regular basis at the minute. We still need to do more work collectively together um, to um, improve that element of, of care that we're providing, because that's where we're seeing some of that urgency and obviously what we really want to do is make sure we're supporting those children and young people before that sort of crisis um, position is reached. I hope that answers the question Francis. Thank you. No, that's great, and, thanks, you, thanks. and you had another question about take up of the app didn't you Francis? I think that might have been a Steve one, the shiny minds. Ah oh, right, Steve? Yeah it wasn't actually in my section it was in Michelle's section but I so uh, but I can get something post note out to you Francis on that. Okay thanks. thanks. Thanks very much. Mike and then Philip. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just wanted to ask you about the continuous professional development funding. Um, it's a really difficult one, this, my experience in, in another trust shows this, that it sounds simple, £1,000 per person, but it's all got to be individualised. Uh, everything's got to be sorted out for whatever it is that they want to spend it on. So we've got some examples here of what's happened. But in the round, how successful are we in spending this this money? Uh, and what are the issues uh, around it if we're not getting through it? Who wants to answer that? You've gone on mute, um, Tracy. Claire, if that's OK. You start. Yeah, Tracy. I was just on mute. Um, so yes, you're right, there is an awful lot of caveats around the money that we have had to navigate with Health Education England in terms of the returns that we've got to do, um, breaking down at yeah, an individual level what that money's been spent on. I think we um, have definitely um, spent the money and we spent it well. We've been creative in terms of how we have um, provided different opportunities for staff, but also brought staff together collectively and and used their combined money to, to deliver programmes that we know sort of service specific areas would, would really profit from. Um, and part of our continuation of getting the money coming in is that we are able to demonstrate that governance and that sort of um, integrity around how we've spent the money, which we have done. So we're now progressing into year three um, and um, it, it has been... Um, all credit to Mal Barnard as our um, education lead who has has really sort of like worked with HEE and finance to get the the return where it needs to be to demonstrate that we're making the most of it because it was a fantastic opportunity that became slightly overshadowed when we realised 
how how difficult that might be to actually orchestrate and deliver. But I think I think we've done it well, um, and so we're we're now into the third year, and um, and I think it's it's then looking at what impact that's had for our staff, and that's also what HE want to see that actually it has it has made the difference they intended, and and will have that impact on things like retention and staff experience, staff survey. So yeah, I think we've done a good job. I okay. just say thank you, Chair, because it, that's that's not the answer I expected. It, it's a really positive answer, and and you've done much better than uh, other trusts may have done. So well done, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the question. Thanks for that information, Tracy. Uh, Philip. Yeah, just one question, and just just a, a sort of something that I noted. Um, the CSROs for flu and vax and COVID seem to be different, and I just wondered whether that was sensible. Um, and then um, I thought, what what would it be like under the sort of recruitment? What would it be like to apply for a GP job? So I went on the website, and it, it, the uh, the the GP job seem quite hidden and confused. Some talk about money, some don't, um, and they're under medical and dental. I just wonder whether they could be made more prominent, because um, GPs have noted to have a short attention span and uh, don't want to go digging for the jobs. And, and Philip can say that because he is a GP <laughs> by trade. You can say that in a way maybe others can't say yes, that. Yes. Um, but fair point. Um, uh, Michael, did you want to come back on that? Uh, the, for the first one, I think uh, Steve and I work very, very closely, discuss almost on a weekly basis at EMT and we update regarding what's happening with the vaccines. I think later on you've got um, uh, a paper uh, which, which broadly looks at what's happening with the flu and with the COVID uh, vaccination delivery. Um, with regards to the second element uh, around the recruitment, I don't know if Steve has any response, but I think that's something we can definitely look at. Steve? Yeah, we can take it away. I mean, Lynn, I, I can talk to Lynn around how GP recruitment's being done. We'll have a look at that, Philip, yeah. I think it's also the visuals of how it's presented. I think you were talking about there really as well on the website and what have you um, as well, isn't it, Philip? Yes, yeah. I mean, GPs are obviously a little bit um, uncertain about being part of a big organisation. Having to dig into an organisation's website sort of really reinforces that uh, you're going to be part of a really big organisation. Maybe easier to get straight to, to something that's that's about general practice recruiting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got Lynn and Michelle. Who wants to go first? I was just going to come back on uh, just to respond back, obviously, about the GP recruitment. Yeah, yeah it's a really good point for it. We can take that away. We we do do it. We have got a separate section for GP recruitment under the Unbelievable campaign and obviously separate videos, etc. But I'll ask Iqbal um, Hussain, obviously our clinical lead in, in primary care, to see if there's any way we can make it a little bit more um, e easier and a bit more clearer. So it's a really good point. So thanks for that. We'll, we'll take the comms away. I'll leave others to look at the recruitment piece, but I'll I'll link in with the comms piece. So, so thanks. And we'll we'll involve you in that work as well, if we as much as we can. Thanks, Michelle. Lynn? It was just on the same point, um, okay. Caroline. Um, we don't just recruit or advertise via NHS jobs either. We do use other recruitment media as well, and we do target it um, to um, local services where it's appropriate to do that. But as Michelle says, very happy to take that away um, and, and have a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, uh, Lynn. We have got two um, uh, items for approval in the report. The first is regarding the safeguarding children policy, and that's at 1.1 of the Chief Exec's report. Are uh, everybody happy uh, with approving uh, the updated children's safeguarding policy for ratification? Yes, thank you very much. And the second uh, um, point to approve is at 1.2 in the internal audit, audit recommendation, which was around conflicts of interest um and assurance being received on that and that's itemized at item 1.2 uh, is everybody happy to with that recommendation being implemented great thank you very much okay then we move on to the publication's policy highlights michelle 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. Again, it's here, the major publications that we've received with the, the relevant lead directors update. Um, again, lots happening. We've mentioned the CQC several times before, but again, it just takes you through the main publications. But I'll leave it there, Chair, unless there's any questions. OK, it's all there. It's all provided for information to take away and, and read at your read at your leisure. OK, no hands. Let's move on then to item uh, nine performance report. Pete, please. Thanks, Chair. So folk will have read the report. They'll see it attached to Appendix B. Is a brief update on waiting times. It's probably worth noting that the detailed report on waiting times is due at next month's board as part of the performance report. I guess in terms of the report you see today, there's probably three areas where we have a discussion that I'm sure my exec colleagues will come in on. So I think following a review by EMT, we have reviewed the fresh for care hours per patient day. You know, so you'll see that in a safer staffing dashboard. Those thresholds have been revised upwards, and the consequence of that is that some of our units have now flagged red for care hours per patient day, where previously they'd have been green or amber. You know, and those benchmarks are based on the model health system. And I'll let Tracy come in on that if there are any questions. I think the other areas to note in the report are, you know, we were successful at getting our out of area beds down to zero. You see that has started to creep up. And I guess, you know, I often say I'm not a clinician, but that's probably very closely linked to the delayed transfers of care where probably 20 percent of our beds are occupied by people that should be in another care setting. You know, I always try and offer a bit of balance. So there are some positives in the report. You know, the two I would pick out is we have high training compliance. It's at 91 percent for this month. And we have seen our sickness levels fall below our trust target. So, yeah, I am conscious of time. So that's a quick summary of some of the highlights. I will, I'll stop there, move to questions or if any of my exec colleagues want to come in. Tracy, did you want to add anything? Just, just to confirm around the care hour per patient day, we have been looking at revising those thresholds because they were set around the what was the model hospital um, thresholds nationally um, in 2019. And we've seen an incremental rise in um, a national level and a regional level in the care hour per patient day. I think it's really important to note that as an organisation, we have always been higher than the national and regional average across the organisation with our care hour per patient day. We do have some really um, diverse services. So, you know, that's not necessarily reflected in, you know, a single threshold. It's difficult to sort of determine a single threshold when we've got, you know, um, services where they have very high, uh, rightly have very high levels of care after patient day versus areas like um, some of our rehab type areas where we would expect them to have low care hours per patient day. Um, we will be doing some work into the autumn to refresh the um, safe staffing reviews and hopefully um, we will be able to move to looking at using um, the local data that we collect. So looking at a, a, a sort of a, um, a team service level at the um, dependency of the individuals that they're working with and allowing that to support us to model what their care hour per patient day should be. Um, we've got some training with NHS England around rolling out the use of the um, mental health optimization tool for safe staffing um, and that that will be cascaded out and that will be a, that will allow us to have some real confidence in the dependency data that we're collecting which will then allow us to translate into maybe more tailored um, yeah. thresholds at a team level but but just to 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 assure the board that that we continue to outperform our peers regionally and nationally in our overall care our patient day um, Thank um you. performance thanks tracy and thanks for the context there as well um right uh stuart is top of the list Stuart. yeah thanks very much um i have a question about um the comment in the highlight report about delayed transfers of care it says the number of delayed transfers of care has risen above the upper thresholds etc a uh, couple of questions one is in a generalized way how do we link that issue to our risk assessments i did have a look at the uh, risk registers both to this committee and i think uh, sorry to the audit committee last time uh, and i'm i'm struggling to see where we're tying that issue with our risk assessments uh, so that's sort of question number one more generally. And there's a graph in the detail to this report uh, which shows us a, a spike going up in, in delayed transfers of cares. And, and Lynn, I was asking you in emails yesterday to comment on that, if you would, please. Thank you. OK, thank you, Stuart. Uh, 
OK, Lynn, do you want to come in on that? Pete? Yes, if I can just pick up the um, risk register. So um, because there has been, as you say, a sharp increase in our delayed transfers of care, where it's affecting um, particular service areas, I can assure you, and I've seen them at meetings this week, Stuart, that um, risks have been drafted um, okay. in relation. So they already were, to some degree, um, represented in the risk registers, but clearly the issues around delayed transfers of care have arisen. And obviously that does create risk, not just in terms of patient flow, but in terms of quality of care, when any patient is in the um, environment that isn't best able to meet their needs, then there's impact and consequence um, for that. So you will see those coming through the risk registers. There is because of the, um, you've already mentioned the steep rise, um, there's a composite risk that um, I have drafted as well. Um, it's in development that um, I think this reaches now um, the level for a operational trust wide risk, particularly as we go into winter. And this is not the desired position that we would want to have been in for the reasons that we've already said. So it is disappointing. We did reach that um, zero out of area placement position back in July. It is the um, delayed transfer position that is directly impacting, unfortunately, the increase in the use of out of area beds. Um, you did ask me to comment on that spike, <laughs> um, Stuart. So, um, at the moment, so for example, we've got um, 21 patients um, in total delayed across mental health um, beds. That's both adult and older people. We also have some delays in our children's um, beds uh, and we also have some delays in our secure um, mental health beds as well. So that overall position um, is rising in terms of a challenge for us right now. And what's contributing to that for older peoples, it's unfortunately predominantly those um, service users, those patients with complex dementia who mm -hmm. require um, residential um, nursing home type support access to that um, is um, uh, it's been difficult anyway for the last couple of years. It's getting more difficult um, in terms of that market that is um, understood at system level. Um, yes. There's a, um, a lot of um, escalation mechanisms um, in place now where we obviously are discussing this almost on a daily, weekly um, basis. Um, in terms of adult mental health delays, it's probably a bit more of a mixed picture. We do have some service users who are um, waiting for specialised NHS beds that we are not commissioned to provide, not commissioned locally. But again, we've got that position with um, usually complex needs where community accommodation um, is required, but it's quite specialised accommodation that we're waiting for and quite bespoke placements. So um, routine delays, I think we're, we're primarily sort of, you know, flowing our um, patients and our beds um, to, 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 to usual routes of discharge, but it is that complex need. Um, that so it is, sounds, is a feature. It, thanks, Lynn. It sounds like you've got a good handle on the cause of the or the root causes without necessarily the leaves of, levers of control over easing the problems. But thank you for uh, for that information. Really helpful. Because from the graphs, it was, hasn't got a scale of the the actual the absolute number of people affected. So twenty one is a helpful answer for me to get my head around that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I um, so just respond to you, Stuart. The portion of our bed base, so we've got 99 um, old people and adult beds in total. So 21 yes. patients delayed through those beds does, yes. I think, describe um, the, the, the scale, scale of the issue. Thanks. Um, thanks, Lynn. I, I, I think I'm going to take away from this meeting just something about because some of that information, it's almost like would be helpful to know for other reasons as well. For example, you know, when I attend things in the ICS, the Humber North Yorkshire ICS, it's often the acute hospitals who are focused on when it comes to delayed transfers. And I just think that we want to make sure that our, it's recognised that we're, we're, we're having to deal with similar problems in terms of it, our inpatient units as well. And it's certainly something that I pick up on my visits around the trust too. But I think let's take that away and think about making sure that's part of the story for the ICS as well. I'm sure others are raising it with them, but it gets lost in the national conversation uh, that we also have those challenges too. Um, uh, Mike. Thank you, Chair. I just want to go back to the safer staff, uh, staffing. 
Um, Tracy anticipated my question on that, I think, and gave us some really useful context and assurance that the problem, as I see it from a lay perspective, is that there's no such thing as a model hospital. That these are indicators. However, it still leaves us with the safer stuff in dashboard that's got a lot of red on it. And I'm just thinking that in terms of assurance, uh, Tracy's commentary was really, really helpful. Um, but I think at some stage, particularly when you've got more data, uh, we need as a board to see that in writing um, and for public consumption, that all of these reds actually are either explainable or we've got innovative models of care or whatever. So thank you, Tracy. And sorry, I asked for another job. <laughs> OK, thanks very much, Mike. Francis. Thanks, Chair. My, mine probably may well link a little bit into what Lynn's already said. So I was looking at the out of area placements, which is also rising. I was just wondering where the system is helping out, because obviously it's due to social care packages and specialised hospital placements. Yeah, um, and hopefully, Francis, the more to come, we are escalating this, really working hard. Um, I have escalation meetings on a weekly basis. Um, I have senior leaders from the other agencies at those meetings. So I think we're doing absolutely everything that we can to escalate these cases. As a consequence of that, we are achieving discharges um, as well, which is obviously positive. But the um, lack of availability, particularly of the community-based um, packages and the workforce challenges around that are... Um, are very difficult. We are doing everything that we can um, in support of that. So, for example, in our learning disability services, we will often, you know, have significant intensive mm -hmm. input into an accommodation <laughs> by our staff um, to, to support the staff that will be, um, you know, supporting that service user until it is a stabilised position. So, I think we've really got to and, and are doing, you know, more of that to achieve timely discharges. Um, as well, but I can assure you, um, it's, it's it's certainly I'm raising. It, I know Michelle is that it's it's the biggest risk we are facing to managing our demand and flow over the coming months, um, as I've described. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Philip. Yes, thank thank you, Chair. A, a key tool to managing uh, mild to moderate mental illness out in primary care is talking therapies. I noted that improving access to psychological therapies. Um, only half the patients have been seen within six weeks. Is, is this a long-standing issue with the service? Have we got an improvement trajectory planned? Um, it's something that's very dear to my heart because we tend to get pushed into dealing with people in a less optimal fashion if we can't get good, um, timely uh, talking therapies through the IAP service. I respond to that, um, Caroline. Yeah. So, um, um, we um, we are very focused on that. We do have a recovery plan in place, and our expectation is for it that we will be recovering it um, over um, well over the next two or three months. Uh, we do work with some subcontracted providers around this. We have very stringent contract management in place around the expectation around activity. But unsurprisingly, you know, some of those contractors are also um, facing some of the staffing challenges that we see too. We do have some vacancies in the service, so we have plans around how we're going to recruit um, to those, but we have maintained and focused, you know, ensuring that um, we reach the 18-week standard, which we are doing. Um, so, so our expectation is, you know, with that recovery plan in place, we will recover the six-week position. Thank you, Lynn. That's reassuring. Thanks very much, uh, Philip. I cannot see any more hands up. No, OK, thanks very much for that. Uh, let's move on to the finance report, Pete. Thanks, Chair. So I'll try and keep it brief. So this is the finance report to the end of August. Key headlines I pull from the report are at month five, you'll note we've hit our financial position, which was namely a £275,000 deficit at the end of August. You know, we've included in the report, like they haven't done in previous months, just a trust level summary of staffing expenditure versus budget because staff is our biggest area of expense so we thought we'd pull that out as a summary because we often get into the weeds a little bit when we talk about staffing variances you know you'll see from the report our agency expenditure continues to be high and we had a review of our agency action plan at EMT on Monday I think it's fair to say there's a little bit further work needed following that discussion at EMT on Monday namely we're at we're looking at developing trajectories against which we can judge 
performance from what we've been told the actions are to improve our expenditure against the agency. And I guess it's worth noting that we have got the board time out in October where we'll be having a review of agency expenditure. So we'll get into a lot of the detail there. Very quickly, the cash position for the trust remains strong, as does, a, as does our better payment practice code. So overall, at aggregate terms, we're in a strong financial position, but we have got some pinch points starting to emerge. And I'll stop there. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Pete, any questions to Pete on the finance report? No? OK, thank you very much for that, Pete. Then we will move on to the Use of Force Act update report. Lynn. Thank you, um, Chair. So assuming people have read the paper, um, I've introduced to the board previously um, the Use of Force Act, um, its requirements, its focus on reducing use of force, reducing restrictive interventions. It came into effect on the 31st of March. What this paper does is to provide you an update of the further work that we've undertaken in the trust and specifies um, more specifically some of the data and reporting requirements uh, which we are now in a good place and will be reporting. Um, it um, has sat very well with the work that we'd already um, embedded in the trust around our reducing restrictive interventions work that reports to the Mental Health Legislation Committee. Um, obviously, there's a different um, and more detailed level of data that now is required. Uh, we are now reporting that, that um, first set of data will be in our next quarterly report to the Mental Health Act Legislation um, Committee. So it's just to provide assurance, hopefully, that we are making progress with this very important area of work. Obviously, we've previously um, updated our policy in relation to this. And obviously, we've done a lot of work to make sure that our staff are very well aware um, of the requirements. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lynn. Any, any questions to Lynn on this? No. Thank you. It's good to see that we're already on top of some of this area already. And it, that's good to know as well. Thank you, Lynn. Moving on then to uh, the suicide strategy. I'm really glad to see this paper on the agenda for us. Um, uh, I've got Tracy and uh, Michael down for this. Who who wants to who's speaking? Michael's the lead. Did you want to say anything, lead, in, uh, yes. Michael, before we go to Tracy? Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as you rightly said, I think this has this paper has been in development for a bit, and I think it, um, it's it's uh, opportune that we do it today. Uh, in the fact that uh, the, I, I, I suppose there will be an update coming out soon as well from um, the National Confidential Inquiry into Suicide and Safety in Mental Health Team. Um, I must say. Uh, the authors, Tracy being the lead, Paul and Kwame have, have put in a lot of effort in bringing it all together. Though the report actually speaks about 10 ways to approach for safer care, I think we have identified in our organization the five core elements which we think we need to focus more on. Um, I think from, from my point of view, I think this, this is a evolving document and I, I don't think at any point in time we can say yes we've done it and that's that's about it or we continue to do what we're doing because things are going to change and new information is going to be sent our way. Uh, it, it has been to the governance committee the paper and one of the key issues was uh, or, or the only thing that was pointed out was are you sharing this with uh, key stakeholders, which we have done subsequently and uh, had uh, responses back and have incorporated those. So without taking any further of your time, uh, I, I'm hoping that Tracy has got a very brief presentation. I, I'm just conscious of the time, Chair, but uh, I'll hand over to Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Tracy? Thank you, Chair. I will try and keep it very brief. So there's time for questions. Let's see if I can share my screen. <clears throat> I'm hoping people can see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so we can. So, um, as Dr. Michael has alluded to, this um, strategic plan sort of um, builds on the work that we've already been doing in our previous strategy around suicide and self harm. Um, um, so we're aware that the national strategy is is anticipated to be refreshed later this year. That will be led by Professor Louis Appleby. 
Um, we've um, decided to look at using the Enkish tool as it is really a gift. They have the largest evidence base around completed suicide spanning back 20 years. So the elements that they've incorporated into the Enkish tool are, are the strongest evidence base that we've got around what we can do as services to, to reduce um, suicide rate. Um, they have also sort of built on and, and um, have a widening evidence base around the impact of COVID-19, and we expect to see that continue over the next few years. Um, locally, we have reviewed our clinical risk um, management processes, which has included a, a refresh of the clinical risk policy and the clinical risk training. So it felt timely to align all of that. Um, and it does align to other national and local strategies, um, so specifically patient safety, patient care experience and drug diagnosis. Um, Mandy's team has led some brilliant work around, um, in conjunction with the ICB lead, around um, post-intervention. Um, so that very much we want to weave through the strategy in terms of the family um, involvement element. And obviously, we continue to look at and have a focus around how we learn from, um, from incidents and, and how that then feeds into, as what Dr. Michael has described, needs to be an organic and a, and a, a sort of fluid um, approach to thinking about suicide and self-harm. As we know, that sort of like emerging trends and, and um, new issues arise um, that, you know, we haven't necessarily encountered previously, especially with our young people population. So just a little bit about the toolkit. Um, it has been developed nationally and was refreshed again based on the findings of the 2022 NKISH report. Um, it, it, it focuses on these 10 elements. So the way that we approached developing the strategic plan was to benchmark ourselves against the, the 10 elements in the toolkit. This piece of work was led by adult mental health and it fed into the ICB um, work around the toolkit. Um, we then identified um, potentially um, gaps in our, in our sort of compliance with some of these elements where we felt they would benefit from a more strategic approach. So that's not to negate all the ongoing work that we're doing around suicide um, and self-harm prevention, but, but these were the elements that we felt would, would really sort of benefit from that more strategic approach. Um, and then we discussed that with, with um, the clinical leads from the other divisions. It went through the clinical network. So we had that internal con consultation and consolidation of what we wanted to focus on. And then as Dr. Michaels described, we, we looked at some external um, consultation, bearing in mind that the toolkit is for providers. So, you know, we, we absolutely want to fit in with what is happening at a system level and we'll, we'll um, you know, we'll be working with the ICB lead around suicide prevention and the, the ICB suicide um, prevention strategy. But this toolkit is very much focused about what we can do as a provider to, to contribute to that overall system reduction in suicide rates. Um, so these are our priorities. Um, family involvement, you will have seen from the forward of the strategy, Anthony Hoof, who was um, lost his sister to suicide, his sister was a, a service user with ourselves, has written a very powerful um, and generous, I think, offer to us as an organisation to work with us to really help us to understand how we can learn when um, tragic events happen, as, as did to his family. Um, very humbling to, to read his words, and we really wanted to make that family involvement element um, a, 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 a priority and a, a, a sort of like the first area that we would be focusing on. Um, and we'll continue to work with, with Mandy's team and, and with the Hoof family in terms of, of, of how we look at developing that, that um, priority. Um, so develop guidance for both depression and self-harm. The self-harm, refreshed self-harm guidance was published in July. We know that that will um, mark a, you know, a, a, a confirmation of a move away from using um, risk assessment tools in a RAG-rated way to predict future risk of suicide. The massive evidence base um, that NAF Kapoor and the, the Enkish team have been have been promoting for a long time that... that um, the evidence shows that the majority of individuals that have completed suicide who have had contact with mental health services have been rated as low risk. So 80% of those that complete suicide have been rated as low risk. So we need to think differently and shift our culture around how we use risk assessment tools as still a valuable resource in that triangulated approach to thinking about risk. But we, we need to move away from using them as a predictive um, means. 
Um, so lots to do about the um, review of those new NICE guidance for self-harm. They will be going through our governance processes, um, but we also already have um, a gap analysis that's been completed about the depression guidance. And I think this, this priority will really focus on how we can think across our services about how we implement evidence-based interventions from primary care right through to tertiary services um, and making sure that every contact counts. Um, Personalised risk management. Um, so we have really sort of emphasised this through um, the, the risk training that we've refreshed and are, are on with delivering. We've made this um, a, a role requirement for all our registered practitioners. It has a real focus on collaborative and MDT formulation. Um, and that will support the rollout of person-centred um, care planning, which is, is, is our um, approach to replacing the care programme approach. Um, Again, the element around focusing on reducing drug and alcohol use, so, so looking at that strategy for how we work with coexisting mental health and um, alcohol and drug misuse issues, both within the organisation. We have a massive resource with the East Riding Partnership in terms of the, the expertise and um, Dr Mayer, who's you know, like a national lead in terms of research around drug and alcohol use. So we, we need to tap into that, but also make sure that we're consistent and aligned to what's happening at a system level around um, the agenda around coexisting mental health and alcohol and drug misuse. Um, and that will include thinking about what roles we may need to um, develop and, 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 you know, how we can think about our training and our policy. Um, and then latterly, um, the last priority is around lower staff turnover. And this is acknowledging that we are already doing a massive amount around retention. So this priority will specifically focus on um, some of the initiatives that we have ongoing around um, improving nurse retention. So that will look at the, the new roles that are being driven nationally through NHS England and the Chief Nursing Officer um, around nurse advocates and nurse ed educator roles and how they may have um, greater benefit across our allied health professional um, professionals, for example, um, and also that consideration of, of, of how we can continue to have that focus on retention, um, specifically in the non-medical professions. Um, so the next few slides just, just shape up some of the things that we will do in terms of each priority. Um, I, I won't go into all of those in detail. These are embedded in the strategy and they also have a, a, a sort of like a a short term and medium term plan aligned to them. So this is around the family involvement, um, development of guidelines for depression and self-harm. Um, and it also shows um, how they're aligned to the refreshed um, strategic objectives and goals for the for the organisation. Um, Personalised risk management, um, reducing drug and alcohol use and lower staff turnover. It's a bit a whistle stop tour through um, the, the sort of okay. consultation as I've made reference to, and the next steps will be around how we really look at a co-produced co implementation plan. Okay. Happy to take that, any questions. Thanks very much, Tracy. Do you just want to remove those slides, if that's okay? Yeah. Thank you uh, very much. Um, any questions from any colleagues? Um, I've got Stuart. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very helpful, uh, Tracy. Uh, very quick question. Uh, have you got a, a number in mind for lower staff turnover? Hey. Um, no, we haven't sort of set a specific target. Um, I think obviously we would want to be within the sort of regional targets and the national targets. Um, it's It's looking at um, probably the initiatives that we would be thinking about would be in the first instance around nursing turnover. Um, so we haven't got a specific target, but I guess that would be part of how we look at the implementation of that um, of that priority. And also, uh, sorry, to, how far are we away from what you've broadly got in mind at the moment? What's the current stat versus where you want to be? So I think we're probably um, would, would be looking at wanting re to reduce it by at least 5%. Um, so I think okay. we... Could you come back some... with some more? Could you provide some more That's detail a... to yeah. the board? That's fine. On yeah. that, um, yeah. Please, Tracy. Yeah. Thanks thank for you. the question, Stuart. Thank you. Hanif. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks for the, uh, the detailed presentation, Tracy. Um, just a query, I thought there might have been more reference um, in terms of stakeholders and particularly external agencies 
Um, section six around the local context and aligning that to discharge and outreach. Um, clearly very difficult for us to be the sole player because of the complex needs of these individuals. Um, but I didn't really see any reference to, to other agencies, whether that's police or some of the agencies that work with drugs and substance uh, abusers. So j just something around there would be helpful. And is, is that a gap um, potentially in the strategy? I think it's it, we've been very mindful throughout that we we absolutely need to be focused at a system level and the wider system in terms of that multi-agency approach to reducing suicide um, and self-harm. And, and to that end, we do work actively with the Crisis Care Concordat and we will be working very closely with the ICB um, Suicide Prevention Lead and that programme of work. I think the way that the Enkish toolkit works is to look at specifically what you what you do as a, as an individual provider, and that sort of feels a little bit counterintuitive because we know that um, actually having an impact on the overall um, suicide rates regionally will will require us to work as a system. So it's I guess as well in in terms of thinking about the implementation plan and um, when we get the refresh national plan, how we can make sure that our, our strategic plan as a provider sits in and is is um, knitted into what's happening at a system level. Um, I think, I think the only thing there, Tracy, is I think what Hanif is saying, if, if we haven't got a reference to it in the report, this is the thing yeah. that everybody looks at as our strategic plan. Yeah. And given it's emphasising family and friends absolutely rightly, uh, there are right, you know, that wider group is really important to this. Um, and if it's not in, the, even if it doesn't fit into a nice, neat box, yeah. It's uh, it's an important part of it and it should stand on its own as a document rather than having to look at a lot of other documents. I think that's what you want to say, isn't it, Hanny? Yeah, Hopefully. yeah, partly. Somebody was looking at this externally, as I say, uh, you know, for, for me, partly is Layman, partly is Associate Ned um, with the um, with the work I've done at micro level, as I say, with drugs and substance abuse individuals. Those that role of external agencies has always been really critical. Um, but yeah. OK. Thanks for raising that, Hanif. I think it's a really important point. Um, uh, Dean. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. And uh, like others, it's uh, really great to have this uh, uh, plan here, isn't it, to uh, to see that. And I know that uh, we've been able to contribute it to contribute to this along the way. And just a couple of uh, comments, just really about at uh, 8.4 in terms of the priority areas about the development of guidelines for depression. Um, and in the um, 8.42, the year two and three priorities, um, looks like a bit of an overlap with the second part of year one and I just wonder given that we've got the sort of ICS establishing is whether there's an opportunity to sort of accelerate that maybe a little bit given the importance of doing that across uh, across the way I, I think Tracy that the, the second part of year one doesn't it sort of overlaps with with year two in terms of the co-produced nature of that and then uh, secondly it was just a uh, also a contribution on the on the turnover f figure and picking up uh, uh, Stuart's point. Uh, um, I know what we mean by turnover here, but I wonder if it might be explicit about talking about levers. Um, so we had a discussion earlier about the importance of continuous professional development, for example, in developing people. And if we develop people, they'll often move on. And that's great uh, to see. And uh, Tracy, we do do a, a deep dive every now and again through the Workforce Committee looking at levers. And it may be there's something that through Steve could have a look about what a good target in a particular area might look like. Uh, around the levers bit of this rather than just having a, a crude uh, you know turnover which may be about people churning around the system but actually making a great contribution to this work okay thank you very much um if we can make a note of all these points because i think these are to take away unless tracy or michael fundamentally disagree um with what is being raised and then we can get an, a note back telling us you know what the outcome of that has been in terms of the points raised if that's all right with colleagues thanks dean very much i'm moving on to steve yeah thanks caroline i, I guess uh, dean picked up some of those so i think something around the 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 turnover for me and i think it is quite nurse focused at the moment and i think you know in a plan and a strategy such as this it goes across all the posts in the organization so i think we just need to be clear that of some of those actions that we know we've got in people strategies and others and that kind of read across because I think it looks quite narrow at the moment so I do think there's maybe a little bit more more that could be done to on that particular priority so I think it's good to have that priority in fits in nicely with all the other objectives within it but I think we could maybe just um, expand on that so that it encompasses 
right across the organisation and picks up, as Dean said, maybe some of the work that we link in we've done through Workforce Committee on Targets. Thank you, Steve. That's noted. Thank you very much. Mike, uh, Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think just, just to kind of put the whole thing into context, this uh, is the strategy of Humber NHS Foundation, Teaching Foundation Trust as a provider, which is going to dovetail into the wider strategy that the ICS is going to be developing. And there will be one from the local authority, one from various other uh, uh, providers of care, which will kind of complement each other. So I think we, we are almost in a kind of, because we, we deliver mental health services, uh, in addition to community and primary care across the uh, across our area, we have almost kind of uh, preempted and and done our uh, strategy paper. Um, but I think this is going to be kind of a model for probably others to look at and see how we can complement that uh, what has what Humber has pro provided. Now, looking at the response from ICS, the only thing that they have said was that they will be looking at uh, uh, mandatory suicide prevention training for all staff across the board, whether they are working in police or fire brigade or whatever. I think that's that's something that's been picked up by ICS and they have responded, which I think if you look at the whole document, it, it, it will kind of uh, reflect that. So I think I think we have achieved what, what we can as an organization in developing it, and uh, uh, approving it and also uh, receiving and noting it at the board. But there are, there are definitely going to be pieces of work that will need to happen outside of that, such as the workforce, as, as rightly pointed out, and as well as working with other agencies who are co kind of uh, workers with us in, 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 the, in the delivery of this strategy. So I think th those those things will continue to happen. We, they are happening and they will continue to happen. But for the purpose of today, I think um, this this uh, paper needs to be received and noted by the board. Thanks. I Chair. think uh, thanks, Michael. I think we can basically we can receive it and note it. Obviously, it's been developed by staff, but I think some of the points being made are, are well made, and it's not to take away from um, uh, um, it's not to take away from other plans being put together by the ICS or others. But I think something that has a reference to how what we do, we engage with some of those other sectors as well. I think it, you know, it doesn't have to be war and peace, but I think something that maybe reflects some of the points made about both the ICS and voluntary groups, but also some of the other services. Uh, I imagine on this, we do a lot of work with the police, for example. Um, and uh, and uh, and I know that that happens, but I think it's just wanting that reflected there. So perhaps we could take that away. Um, I just wanted to make a, a point, and to be honest, I, I think it's about quite a lot of the uh, documents that are put together. Um, I there are in terms of presentation, some of it is really readable because of the way the design of it and the font size. But the font size changes throughout the document, um, and I've t the use of <laughs> sorry to be pedantic about this, but the use of um, uh, color blocks and then the font the font color that you use in it, some of it is really hard to read. And I think it does a disservice to the content, um, to be honest. So I, I will send a few points about that. But I find this on quite a lot of reports. People want to squeeze lots of information in and then the font size goes down or they want to fit it in a box. And I think, if anything, we've got to make things easy to read, um, particularly for people who for this information isn't necessarily their specialist area. Um, um, so I will... Um, uh, if you could just have a look at that and get some symmetry on some of that, I think that would be helpful too. But I'm really, I think there's a huge amount of uh, work being done on this. I'm delighted to see that Anthony Hoof has got the foreword on him. And that honestly in itself as a starting point for this, the document is, is really wonderful to read, to be honest. Heartfelt, um, because I think it took a lot for him and his family to engage when they lost Sharon. And we've had obviously Anthony to the board uh, before to share that story, um, but also just how constructive and productive his input has been into this process. And of course, he is a, a PACE governor as well. And we're delighted to have him on the on the Council of Governors. So great lot of work. But I think there's some extra bits that people have said today that are worth taking away and, and, and thinking about and, uh, and letting us know the outcome of your your discussions, Michael and, and Tracy, on that, if that's OK. But with those with those you know, positive caveats, 
I, th I think we're really happy to receive this report and I, I think that's agreed by everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. OK, we are running a little behind time, so but everyone needs a comfort break. Uh, so we will stop now. Uh,
Welcome back uh, to the uh, Trust Board meeting of Humber Teaching NHS Foundation Trust. We are now at item number uh, 13, which is the Patient and Care Experience Annual Report, and we have um, Mandy Dawley with us uh, to present. Hi there. Um, Caroline, am I OK to play the film? Which yes, please. Lovely. I'll share my screen now. Thank you. Patient and carer experience, including complaints and feedback, annual report 21-22, provides an overview of the work carried out across the organisation to support the patient and carer experience and engagement agenda over the past 12 months. Involving patients, service users, their carers and our partners in all that we do has become an integral part of our culture and everyday thinking. In order to embrace the broad perspective, we actively listen to people from all parts of the community with equality and diversity as the golden thread woven throughout the patient and carer experience agenda. There is an immense wealth of knowledge that we can access from our patient service users and carers to help us with our improvement journey and transformation plans. The report also provides an overview of the complaints and feedback for the 12 month period Analysis of the themes from complaints and concerns is used to identify areas for learning to improve patient experience. The patient and care experience strategy includes 12 priorities, all of which align to the Trust's six organisational goals and are the focus for the Trust's five-year patient and care experience plan. Here's what we've been doing over the past year. We continue to host regular patient and care experience forums to enable patients, service users, carers, staff and partner organisations to be actively engaged with the Trust. April saw the introduction of our Carers Involvement Forum, which has strengthened our approach to involving carers, families and loved ones in Trust activities. We continue to support the Armed Forces Covenant and have launched a new champion called the Armed Forces Community Navigator. Staff who have a passion for advocating and championing the needs of serving personnel, veterans and their families are taking on this extremely valuable responsibility to enhance their job role and support their team. This year saw the introduction of the Humber Youth Action Group, which has been developed to bring together young people between the ages of 11 and 25 to get involved in trust activities. The Trust has been working with young people to co-produce the design of the group, from creating the vision to developing the ways of working. The young people are developing an understanding of our children's and young people's services in the Trust and are starting to be active participants in improving and shaping these services. We now have over 20 young people involved in the Humber Youth Action Group. On the 1st of March 2022, three initiatives were launched, including the Panel Volunteer Initiative to support the organisation to employ the right staff by including patients, service users and carers on interview panels. The Patient and Carer Experience Training Programme, where individuals are now able to access several training resources to develop their knowledge when getting involved in trust activities and the Making Every Member Count initiative, where the Trust is delivering a standardised approach to make every member count when individuals are getting involved in Trust activities. Work is in progress to refresh existing demographical data templates on our IT systems. This will deliver a strengthened approach to identify who our wider communities are, to enable us to engage and involve them so that their voices are heard to inform service redesign and improvements. The Trust has developed a co-production stamp to demonstrate the work that has been co-produced in partnership with patients, service users and carers. This is a great way to add value and recognition to the hard work and support that goes into co-produced work. The Trust has a co-production stamp quarterly draw for all teams. Every time the co-production stamp is approved, the team is entered into the draw and the winner is randomly selected at the Trust Staff Champion of Patient Experience Forum, where they can win a £25 voucher. During the past year, the Trust has responded to a total of 535 complaints. 235 of these are formal complaints 
and 300 are informal complaints. For the same period last year, the Trust responded to a total of 344 complaints, 133 were formal complaints and 161 were informal complaints. On comparing the two years, there has been an overall increase of 102 formal complaints and 89 informal complaints. This is due to the restrictions lifting regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and the Trust has returned to the expected level of complaints. Of the 235 formal complaints, 37, 16% were upheld. 68 complaints, 29% were partly upheld and 130 complaints, 55% were not upheld. For the previous year, the Trust responded to 133 formal complaints, of which 19 were upheld, 14%, 42 were partly upheld, 32%, and 71 were not upheld, 54%. Key themes for complaints are patient care and communication. Patient service users, carers and families sometimes compliment our staff offering their gratitude and thanks for the wonderful service they provide. The Trust received 304 compliments for the period 1st of April 21 to 31st of March 22, which compares to 212 compliments received for the same period the previous year. So what next? We realise that the best way to improve quality in an organisation is by finding out what patients, service users and carers say through their lived experiences. During 22-23, we will continue to work together in partnership with our patients, service users, carers, staff and partner organisations to develop a plan to involve and engage everyone in trust activities for the next five years from 2023 to 2028. There will be several ways in which individuals will be able to have their say to inform the next chapter of patient and care involvement and engagement across all of our services to really make a difference. For more information or to receive a copy of this full annual report, please contact the Patient Experience Team. Thanks very much. And I actually had a look at that film uh, last night and, and did email Mandy to say, I just think it's a really, really good, easy to understand, clear um, animation of, of, of and fair and balanced, I think, as well, in terms of what it's saying, too. And I think, you know, well done to the team for this. And I presume that's going to be able to be accessed via the website, but maybe throughout GP surgeries and other places around the trust for people to to see. But, you know, very well done on that. Um, over to you, Mandy, for the presentation. So we've highlighted what we've been doing over the last year. So um, I won't go into any detail, but I just wanted to um, pick out um, the one area to escalate, which I included on the front sheet, and that was around primary care. So there's been a lot of, um, you know, conversations, discussions, activity in our primary care services from members of the public um, about their experiences um, in accessing GP surgeries from getting an appointment to getting a, an appointment in the way they want, whether it's face to face or virtual, with whom they want. So a lot of work is going on behind the scenes with primary care. Um, I took um, a report to one of um, the groups that I attend regularly and QPASS a few weeks ago to try um, to share some findings. Um, I did some triangulation of complaints, compliments, friends and family test information to really do a deep dive into what's everybody saying. And it doesn't come as a surprise because it fits very, you know, um, very similarly with the national picture. And it's about getting appointments, getting through on appointment lines, etc. But what I can say with validity from everything that I've read and I've triangulated, once a patient actually gets through to see a clinician of choice, they do experience very, very, you know, it's for staff, for instance, they're very kind, caring, compassionate, 
um, they share information, they feel like they're involved in the conversations about the care they're receiving, it comes out really high. And the friends and family test, you know, figures on average are between 90-95%. So that's saying that, you know, nine out of 10 patients are really happy with their experience in, you know, of that appointment on that day, because they do fill the friends and family test survey form in when they've had their appointment. And also, we, you know, there aren't masses of complaints, we get quite a large number of compliments. So it is actually very well balanced, but we know there's work to do. Um, now, the practice managers of our GP practices, they meet on a very regular basis. They do look at their friends and family test data monthly. Lorna and my team has come to join me today. I've wanted Lorna to, um, to come to board with me to present because it's a team effort with me and Lorna together. Um, so I thought it's important that she's in the room too. And um, Lorna prepares the report for primary care every month for all the GP practices. It's the only division that we actually provide this report for because this is where we get a lot of our feedback. And primary care at the moment don't have an engagement lead, whereas the other divisions do. So we take this, um, you know, this role on. And basically what that um, report um, shares is all the, you know, I would say all the feedback, but a lot of the thematic analysis of the feedback on a monthly basis from friends and family test um, so that all the practices can share with each other what's been said about them and what they're doing about it. You said we did takes place in every surgery every month. They look at the friends and family test information and then they work with the thematic, the thematic analysis to enable them to make quality improvements in their surgeries. And that information is also shared on the trust on the well on the websites in the practices that you said we did. And also they put um, the information up on, on the notice boards in the practices as well. So this is happening consistently. They also look at the GP survey data because nationally every year in January, as you'll know from the report, there is the primary care survey and that information was also drafted into this triangulation too. And on the back of the results of the survey that came out in July, each practice is writing an action plan. And I believe the action plans are nearly complete now. So that to basically share with us all what they're doing about some of the feedback that's been received in the GP survey. So there is a lot of work going on just to assure you, you know, in, in primary care. Um, on, the, on the back of all the feedback that's received. And finally, patient participation groups. So patient participation groups have been um, very, um, very successful in some practices, but not so in others. So there's been a big drive recently to get PPGs up and running in every practice in the trust. So Market Wheaton, they've had a PPG for many years now, and that still continues to, um, to run. We've got our GP practices that have merged in Bridlington, um, our Humber Primary Care, and they've got their um, first PPG as a merged set of practices on the 6th of October at Manor House. Um, our two Hull practices, Princess Medical Centre and North Point, they've both developed a merged PPG as well, and their first meeting is on an evening on the 10th of November and King Street, they continue to host their PPGs as well. So there are patient participation groups now in every practice, um, some about to start and others that continue. So patients can have their voice in their PPGs too. Thank, thanks very much, Mandy. That's really good to hear because when you get a certain you know, size, there'll be able to be interaction between those PPGs as well as sort of pulling it together across the piece. So it's a sort of uniformity in how we engage in some way. I think that would be that's really good to hear yeah. that that works yeah. um, being developed. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks very and much. And my team, Caroline, they've also supported the practices with a framework to set up PPGs yeah. as well. So there is a framework now to support each, each surgery. So we have got a consistent approach across the whole of Humber. Good to hear. Good to hear. OK, over to colleagues. Uh, unless, Lynn, did you want to say something? More generally, or do you want to come in a bit later? Now, if you don't mind, it's no, no, fine. Sorry, the yeah, sure. The conversation that um, Mandy's just described around um, GP survey Lynn, results. Lynn, Lynn, do you want to turn your camera off because you're crackling again? Sorry. <laughs> <Is that laughs> We'd love better? to see you, but it might work better. 
Is that any better? Uh, no. Uh, no, ca- I will. Ca- um, start back in. Start, but we'll carry on with some questions and then d- come back in. I'll take you when you come back okay. in. Is that okay? Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Stuart. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so, uh, Mandy and, and indeed Lorna, thank you very much for that report. Very clear. And I kind of really uh, get a sense that you continue to be curious and probe about uh, what's going on be, below the data and to improve, which I really welcome. I've got a couple uh, an observation. One is that at a re- uh, I think a, a recent governor's forum, it, it, I think that group, uh, what do you think, uh, Caroline and Pete, we were at a meeting last week. I think some of our governors would appreciate this presentation. Uh, who had some questions about how we were listening to voices. That's one observation. And the question is this, um, are, there, are there voices or groups of voices that you think we're not hearing from, either either good or bad? So have we got any kind of uh, patches of silence where you'd expect that there'd be some, some noise coming through the system? Thank you, Stuart. Mandy? To be honest, primary care, Stuart, has been our, um, our biggest... Um, I suppose, voice over the last couple of years since COVID. Yes. Um, because we have got a number, a large number of groups now set up um, across all of our divisions, um, we are very well covered and yes. people do have an opportunity. Um, since I started in my role five and a half years ago, um, the patient and carer experience agenda has grown phenomenally and now each division has identified funding and have an engagement lead to drive the operational aspects of the patient and carer experience agenda and within each of those divisions there are groups where patients are able to come in and have a voice and have a say and get involved in trust activities so across mental health secure services children and young people services and it was only earlier on this week um, i was interviewing with the division for um, a lead in community services and primary care so, so you've got um, the, you've got so you've got your channels open which is have, great isn't it i d- just have. wondered if you you were picking up whether you think those channels are being underutilized in some areas but it sounds as though yeah. not from your no, question um, your primary care I would have said was if you've had, had a, if you'd passed me that question I hadn't given that update prior to that question um, but and that's because they haven't got that operational lead to help run the primary the PPGs but we've yes. already got those you know um, ready to go where the, where there wasn't one so they do have the voice there as well so I feel that we're, <coughs> that we're well covered thanks a lot Uh, Thanks. And uh, Mandy and I are already having a conversation about the next Governor Development Day and maybe we could look at the next Council of Governors agenda as well, Mandy, uh, if we can, if that if that works around you and and the team. Um, Hanif. Uh, Thank you very much, Mandy. Great, great presentation. Um, I was in a discussion the other day that that was really um, saying that an upward trajectory in complaints isn't always necessarily a bad thing. Um, quite often can allude just to, to better mechanisms and systems being implemented, not just maybe a bounce back from COVID. And it sounds as if it, if that is the case. It, it's really almost a forward planning type um, suggestion or question in that just in terms of the environment where we're at, both in terms of pressures on the NHS and then combined with cost of living crisis and everything else that we're going where it may well be that if we did some forward um, uh, analysis, that the trajectory may continue to go upwards, whether you think we need to put anything in place now or begin to be looking at anything in place that just enables us to have adequate resource in place, whether that's personnel or systems, to to be able to cope uh, with that anticipated increase in in complaints in particular I'm referring to. Mandy? That's definitely something to consider for the future, definitely, in within the team and the capacity. I mean, it's, mm. a, it's a very small team, but it's perfectly formed. And there are many years experience in the team with regards to the complaints and feedback side. Um, but obviously, um, you know, we can't predict at this moment in time what complaints are going to look like in the future. However, what we have done recently, and this is courtesy of the Mental Health Services Division, they have developed a complaints animation film and it is absolutely fantastic. It's just over a minute long, so it's not long for staff to watch. And it's all about how to deal with 
concerns when they're coming in and how to prevent escalation if you can deal with it informally. And we did start to develop processes at the beginning of COVID. So when COVID first hit us um, and there was a national pause on complaints, we looked at our own systems and processes at that point a couple of years ago and we triage complaints now. So if we feel that a complaint can be informal and can be escalated to the team quickly, for them to contact the patient, the complainant, be it on the phone, ASAP, within the 24, 48 hours, for example, it can often pacify the complainant and that can be enough to stop the formal complaint. So that's where you'll see there's a little bit of a shift in the numbers when, um, when you saw the film. So hopefully, with some of these proactive measures, it will help us to, you know, to support this to support the complaints process moving forwards and and the potential escalation of complaints uh, and we're also we're working closely with our partner organizations as well so for instance last week i was working with a member of staff and a partner organization one of the carers groups to look at food banks and it's you know it's looking at some initiatives you know creative initiatives that might help with some of the concerns that we can foresee moving forwards with the cost of living crisis and you'll have noticed on the global email last week an email went out to staff regarding food banks as spaces in the across the organization so if we can get a few more ideas and work with our patients carers and service users as well as well as our partner organizations to come up with some more creative ideas that you know that will be a a good way forward thanks Mandy. i've seen that animation as well um, and i think that's that could just be applied across all our services, not just those it, in mental health, because it it's about not parallel. being defensive. Um, it understands the staff point of view and how obviously people should behave towards staff. But I think it's really, really helpful. And as you say, it's only, is it three minutes or something? How long is it? It's not even that. I mean, it's, it's not three even that, minutes, is it? But it's about one minute and 30 yeah. seconds, something like that. It's it, only short. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. It's really and good. And it is going to be rolled out across the whole trust. Yeah. Um, maybe we can get Jenny to do the, send the link to that for everybody. Um, so um, colleagues can see it as well. Um, OK, thank you. Michael. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a quick one. I, I was going to introduce Mandy and thank her, but uh, I'll take this opportunity to thank Mandy and the team once again for, for producing this. And also the fact that you have always been innovative in how you present information, which makes it uh, so much more worthwhile or so much more interesting to listen to. Um, and also uh, a word about the PALS team. I think they do a fantastic work and I think we need to convey our thanks to them because always keeping the investigators, the execs on their toes to make sure that time scales are stuck to and all this stuff, I think is, is a wonderful. And I think from the PACE team point of view as well, not just taking yourselves as someone who gathers information and passes it up, but also proactively involving yourselves in organizing various fora and making sure that there is engagement, I think it is really commendable. Thank you so much for this report. I, I, I was hoping, Chair, if we could bring Lynn in because there was this specific response that we wanted to kind of uh, make the board aware regarding what work is happening with especially primary care. So I know we, we had to, Lynn had to rejoin, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank I, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that prompt, um, Michael. Lynn, would you like to come in if you're with us? Can you hear me? Perfect again. Great. <laughs> so frustrating. Yeah, I was just going to endorse what Mandy was saying about the work around particularly the GP survey results. So those are being overseen um, operationally as well. The action plan will be coming back to the operational delivery group and then obviously it will be taken to the executive management team. And really what we're focusing on there, there is some variation in those results as well. So I know Iqbal, um, Dr Hussein is our clinical lead, is really looking at those results um, very closely and obviously where we can and where we must do, if we've got better practice in one of our areas, then how do we make sure that that is transferred and disseminated um, elsewhere as well? And that will very much feature in our action plan. But I just wanted to use a little bit of an example um, as well. So Michelle and I met with members of the um, Market Wheaton PPG and the Town Action Group this week. It was a very constructive conversation, um, but undoubtedly they are concerned around the GP survey results. It's that access question that Mandy raised as well. So what we 
are able to see and um, they were complimentary about was access via the telephone. The responsiveness has improved, but access to timely appointments is still a challenge and we recognise that. So there is a lot of work, as Mandy describes, on what we can do to improve that position um, overall. So Michelle and I will continue and particularly to meet with that group. We're happy to meet with others as well. But um, obviously, unsurprisingly, that is what our patient population are wanting to see improvement within. So um, it'd be great when we see those action plans, which will endorse that position um, as well. So it's just to add that sort of operational perspective to, to Mandy's work. Thank you. Okay, thanks very uh, much, Lynn. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just to obviously reiterate what, what Lynn has said, but obviously to thank Mandy and the team. Just touch you know that obviously the, the, a lot of this, this has been seen at EMT in various guises, but it, it is helpful, I think, if, if it actually does go go via EMT. Um, some of the data in there, obviously the primary care information particularly needs to be monitored um, more regularly. I think we just need to not really just use the, the friends and family test. So we're going to look at other ways of surveying through the uh, PPGs, et cetera, GP surgery. So we're going to link that in through the EMT that will go down to uh, the operational delivery group, sorry, the executive management team through the operational delivery group. I also would like a conversation at the executive management team about the complaints because there's been a slight increase in complaints if you'd noticed in relationship to the data. So I think that warrants a detailed conversation at the executive management team. I appreciate it's been to quality committee, but I'd like to just have a look at some of the operational aspects of that as well. So if Jenny, you can make a note, that'll be really helpful. But thank you, Mandy. Great video. And we will circulate it via the usual communication routes because obviously we're doing more and more by video now, which is great. It makes it a lot more accessible. And thanks, as always, for your tireless work on patient and, and service user and care involvement, because I know it is a significant uh, improved area over the last few years. And that is down to your leadership. So thank you, Mandy, for that. And I look forward to following up some of the conversations later. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Steve. Yeah, just to reiterate that point from Michelle, really, there's quite a lot of info. It's really good, but there's quite a lot of information there that certainly I haven't seen before. And I know probably Pete hasn't as well. So just to reiterate what Michelle's saying that, you know, for us to be able to have that and have a, be able to contribute into it would be really good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, uh, well done, Mandy. Um, uh, the only point I just like to maybe take away to consider, and it follows really on from Michelle's point about data, on page seven of the report, where it talks about improvements made um, in terms of people turning up to appointments, people being able to contact, you know, 24 seven, I think that's all really good. Uh, putting on the websites, the number of DNAs, I had to read that twice, uh, do not, uh, did not attend. I just wonder, to be honest, in the interest of transparency and also accountability, whether as well as the, the um, number of uh, do not attends, there should also be canceled appointments or change time to appointments, because I think it works both ways, this. Um, or maybe that's something that should be picked up at the EMT about knowing how many appointments made are actually cancelled by the practice, as opposed to not just having the do not attends on it. Um, I think that would be quite worthwhile looking at uh, to see how it's working. So maybe I could just leave that to take away um, to discussions elsewhere. But thank you very much, Mandy. Um, and I'll be in touch about the governor's session coming up um, in the next month or two. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. And and Laura, Lorna, is it Lorna? Lorna. Lorna. Sorry, Lorna, to Lorna too, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on then to the winter plan, uh, Lynn. Yes, thank you, Chair. So um, to introduce this briefly, obviously the paper sets out that we are expecting this winter across the NHS and social care systems to be particularly challenging. The context of that, um, as the paper describes and as we've been reporting here, um, every board, is that the system pressures um, as a consequence of COVID, the recovery of the elective activity in the acute system, um, those pressures have not abated um, over the year um, at all, really. So going into winter with that context of system pressures being high anyway we often talk about actually you know winter is a distinct period you know do, do we actually have that definition we probably don't um anymore however it's really important that we get um into a place where all of our op operational planning is robust but that we do have a plan in place to um tackle and um, be prepared for what we expect 
um, to be forthcoming um, over the coming months. So as you can see from the paper, it's predicated on um, there were particular objectives set by our ICB in relation to expectations and what we need to respond to this coming winter. A general sort of overview of the factors that are underlying that by way of context Infection prevention control and management obviously remains key to us, not just in relation to COVID, but we are expecting there is predictions around flu being prevalent um, this winter as well. And obviously we do have other um, winter related um, respiratory infections, norovirus, um, those types of situations. Obviously, we will be participating in ourselves. Our staff will be vaccinated in relation to flu and to COVID. Obviously, the impact of COVID in relation to testing regimes, the cost of living pressures has particularly predicated our report um, this time around. And we have considered the risk of possible industrial action, obviously connected to cost of living pressures, and what we would see anyway by way of surge and escalation, and the possibility of the impact of adverse weather. There is a detailed operational plan that has been reviewed by the executive management team that supports this narrative report. Um, but it's really here, hopefully, to give the board um, assurance that we do have a robust plan. It has been developed with our system partners. There are operational mechanisms in place which we will monitor that plan very regularly. We will be escalating to our executive management team if there are any issues with the plan and obviously into our wider system as well. We've talked about the delayed transfers of care position already today. This report reflects that that is one of our biggest and challenging risks in terms of patient flow um, currently and um, expected to continue through um, the winter months. So um, I'll um, stop there, but very happy to pick up any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lynn. Are there any questions? Uh, Francis. Thanks, Chair. Great report, Lynn. Really comprehensive. Um, like you, I, I do question whether there is a difference between winter and the rest of the year. It just seems to be a year-round <laughs> pressure at the moment. A couple of, of questions. Uh, under two, the emergency preparedness resilience, you, you've done a desktop exercise. Just wondered how that had gone. Um, the you, you picked up on the delayed transfers. It's the obvious one to pull out with what we discussed earlier on. I wondered how the crisis line was, was going, if there was a slight update on that. Um, and the uh, ambulance colleagues work that you've done on this support vehicle, I wondered if there's only one support vehicle, you know, it's a fairly big geography, so to speak. How does that work? Yeah, so just to pick up those questions, if I've noted them in order, <laughs> Francis, the desktop <laughs> exercise was specifically around secure services and evacuation planning. That went well. Um, that's just been drawn together as a consequence of the learning from that exercise um, at the moment as well. So, um, but obviously we will continue to focus in that area. Sorry, what was your next point? The there was two the mental health and crisis line. How that was going? The crisis, home. yeah. The, the crisis line um, actually um, response times to the crisis line we monitor very closely. That's actually going very well. Um, at the moment, we did have a bit of a dip very early in the year, sort of January, February time. We've worked on that. Um, obviously, we um, work very closely with our colleagues in mind, have really good performance monitoring and um, Francis in, in place in response to that. So um, we're actually pleased with the progress um, in that service currently. And then the other one was the mental health app vehicle that you've got, which is a great yeah, idea. The, the, yes. Yeah. So. And um, this has been predicated on some pilot work that's already taken place. So the operation of the vehicle it is in a defined geography, um, I have to say, but it actually is in that geography where demand is highest. The difference with this um, current initiative is that we will have mental health specialist clinicians on board in the ambulance. However, there is a bit of a caveat, Francis, because obviously the pressure on the ambulance services at the moment, and obviously um, Yaz as well, is, is possible that vehicle might be um, detoured to category one, higher category calls. So um, we understand that. Obviously, we monitor that very closely as well. So it'd be very interesting to see. But, but um, the pilots certainly have demonstrated a positive impact on patient pathways. So there will absolutely be benefit. But I do think that risk of diverting to, um, to other calls um, is something we need to, to monitor closely. Thanks. Thank you. 
Lynn, thank you, Francis. Um, I can't see anybody else with their hand up. Uh, Michelle. It's just a quick, just to build on that point, obviously, about the ambulance response, obviously, we're keeping a close eye on that in relationship to ambulance pressures as well, because there may be uh, an issue as we do out that, but it's having some really good results at the moment. Just the second thing, obviously, we link in all our business continuity plans into the wider system, both from a mental health point of view as well as from the community, because what we're trying to do is get a little bit more of a joined up approach across the system in relationship to, to the challenges and the pressures that, that providers are facing. So we'll bring the system continuity plans back to the board uh, later. We've already got one in mental health. We've had one for a while. We just need to do a bit more detail on the community aspect. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Liz, for that report. Now, I'm going to go to item number 20. Uh, we have uh, Kiza here, Isherno, who is our new Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Officer, uh, because I know she's got something else at midday. So if, if Oliver and others can hold on, uh, we'll take Kiza first with Alison Meads, I think, as well. Are you there, ladies? Caroline, do you want me to introduce it? That, oh, yes, that, fine. Know, OK, Steve. Is that all right? We've got just... um, so uh, we've got Kiza on the um, uh, on the call. So thank, thank you, uh, Caroline, for doing that, in, that introduction. So Kiza's our new workforce ED and I lead and has been with us with us a few a few weeks. Um, just with regards to setting the scene for the report. So um, board members will be familiar with this in the sense that we bring this every year. It's a joint report between Dr. Michael and myself in that it picks up the workforce EDI uh, uh, work that we've done over the past 12 months, but also that kind of service uh, front, front facing uh, patient experience side to, to ED and I as well. So it's, it's evolved over time. Hopefully we've got a report that's informative for you and you've had a chance to go through all the details. Um, Keys will be able to pick up any 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 details that you might have. And I'm really conscious, Caroline, that there was a question last time around the ES, EDS2 that we maybe didn't do the detail to and from there. So, so Keys can pick that up for you if, if you want to, to, to do that. Also really conscious that we took this through Workforce Committee and Quality Committee. So I know it's had a, a good going over already, um, but I'll um, I'll throw it open to to questions. Or Keisha, if you want to introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about it, then 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 please do. Yeah, Thanks sure. Steve. Thank you. Hi, sorry. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and it's really good to be here. It's a really good opportunity for me to meet everybody. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've come from Centrica. Um, I was at Centrica for seven years. So I've come from the private sector, absolutely new to the health sector. So I guess I'm coming with fresh eyes, which might be a positive. Um, um, basically, um, look. At, did you want me to go through the EDS two? Sorry, Steve. Or did you want me to um, just bring out some of the, p the points around the the annual report. So, so what I'd do, Keezer, if it's okay with you, Caroline, as chair, is I, I, I I'd throw it open for questions because um, yeah. everyone will have read it, and it might be, you know, because it's quite a wide ranging report, it might come from any angle. So, I would, uh, I would probably, if that's okay with you, chair, throw it open, and uh, okay. we'll do our best to field okay. the questions that come through. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Okay. Open to questions, please. Right. Well, See, I've set it up. I've set it up now. Yeah, I've really, given it yeah, the big okay, build-up, right. and then there's Stuart, no questions. Stuart, Stuart. They're not usually this shy, Keezer. Stuart, then Hanif. <laughs> yeah. Stuart. Hi, Keezer. I'm, I'm Stuart McKinnon. -Ems. I'm one of the non-executives. Hello. So my question is not about your report, which is very comprehensive and I really enjoyed reading it. And I can see there's a lot of action being taken in response to, in response to the data. So my question is just a few weeks in coming into the organisation. What's your overriding first impression of the what what lies ahead for you? So I found it really interesting. Um, essentially, I'll just give you I think it might be quite useful to give you a little bit of detail around the approach that I'm taking and how I'm sort of setting up my stall and how I think that I can make a good impact here. So um, you might have noticed that I've been doing a lot of focus around um, building the networks up, the staff networks. Um, and also the National Inclusion Week, which I'm really happy that you've all embraced it and you're having the backgrounds on your teams. There's um, a, a reason behind this, and it's not just because I love staff networks. It's because going forward, I see my work only being successful if there's that collaboration. And essentially, the staff networks 
will be provide me with those forums where I can go to them and consult on work going forward. So what I'm seeing at the moment is I think we are in a good position, but I think that there's work to do with um, kind of gaining traction and momentum. Also, another point that I have um, noted and I wanted to bring up is that I think there's a really, really good um, sort of basis and foundation for me in terms of um, programmes that are already in place um, and a really good approach to looking at policy. Um, but on the flip side, and I think, Michelle, we touched upon this when we've been speaking about the Respect campaign, is that I think there's also another a really important point to make that we can have all of the policies and we can have all of the procedures, but if we don't have the cultural element running across the whole of the organisation and getting that culture right and having everybody on board with getting in an inclusive mindset, then, you know, the, the policies and procedures won't land. So I think there's a big piece around that. So, for example, doing this National Inclusion Week, for me, um, sometimes people think that Awareness Weeks and Awareness Days are sort of a bit airy-fairy, but I actually think that they're a really, really important vehicle to get conversation going and get people talking um, and kind of weave it through gradually through the organisation that, you know, inclusion actually should be at the forefront of our minds and everything that we're doing. So that's my starting point, if that makes sense. It does makes perfect sense. Thank you. Thanks, Kiza. Uh, Hanif. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hi, Kiza again. Uh, we, we, we met recently at the uh, the Anti-Racist Network meeting. You, you really picked up my point there because I was going to say, like colleagues, the report is great. Um, metrics and, and milestones and, and KPIs always very useful to, to read, but but with EDI the real challenge is culture change. Um, I'm 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 confident from discussions I've had with Caroline and Michelle that you'll you'll be pushing against an open door here. Uh, I suppose the question really is um, now now that you've made the point about culture change that what we as if you like the the table at the top from from both Neds and and the exec can really be doing more of to to assist you with implementation of both what you've outlined here in in the annual report, but what we've discussed um, at some of the staff networks. Yeah, so essentially, Hanif, I'm 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 really really grateful because um, as soon as I've come into the organisation, I've definitely felt the support, and I've felt you know Michelle reached out, Caroline reached out, Steve, you've been absolutely amazing from day one. We've had really open conversations. So if I can just put out an ask to everybody. Um, to continue with that support because going forward, that is what I'll need because if we can role model this right from the top and do a trickle down effect, that is definitely the way forward. I mean, coming from Centrica, that's a very large organization. Obviously it's, it's 25,000 people. Our CEO there was very much on board with EDI. And when he came in and um, the change from the, his predecessor in terms of his approach and his buy-in and keeping that conversation going in everything that we did, it, it, it made an instant change. So my major call out and my major ask would be is if we can keep this, it's not just this week, if we can keep this at the heart of everything that we talk about, that would be of great support to me because I'm only one person. So we talk about cultural change, but to do that, we need to be have everybody on board essentially. So yeah, that would be great, Hanif. Thank you, Dean. Yeah, thank you, and it's uh, it's great to get the uh, comments from other colleagues about the uh, the, the report. Um, we have had this report in both the uh, quality committee and the the workforce committee, um, and the reason for that, I think, uh, the unique thing about this uh, report is it does cover both those aspects of, if you like, staff representation. Um, but also uh, service delivery. Um, so although we we often concentrate on representation of staff in terms of equality, diversity, the end is about having an organisation that's able to represent and serve its community. And um, the other thing on this report, I think, that uh, we certainly picked up in, in the Workforce Committee is that although there's more to do in you know different areas, if you look at the range of things that's going on here, you know, in terms of uh, gender, disability, learning and autism, uh, both uh, within the organisation and staff and within the service areas, it gives a really sort of good uh, sort of overview of that range of all those sorts of protected uh, characteristics. So uh, really great to see that. And I think that was welcomed at both the Workforce Committee and the College Committee and that mesh and reading across of the sorts of things that we've been doing. So uh, so thank you for the report. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Michelle. 
Yes, to conclude, just say, well, welcome and thank you again. And it's great to be doing this work uh, jointly. And I agree with, with, with you about the sentiments about the week and the inclusion week. I think it's really important, but I think it's that cultural piece that builds on the cultural work that we've been doing anyway. Yeah. which is why we'll be bringing back to the board I think we've mentioned this a little bit at the board before our paper about the respect campaign that we're going to be working through um so thanks to any and others we've we've got the center for diversity which will be coming in to do a, a wide of respect for everybody you know across the organization and that's really quite exciting to do and and Kiza and the team will be leading that work so we'll be bringing that back to the board but but thank you for that and uh, I agree it's about that constant cultural piece that we need to do and I think there's been a few articles today believe it or not at the health service general about the wider health service as well so there's obviously some work that we need to do but great progress and it's good to see the report thank you thanks very much Michelle uh Steve yeah, just to mop up really, Caroline, if that's OK. So um, thanks, Keys. I just passed my thanks on as well for the work that you've done. Um, I know, uh, you know, in a really short space of time, you're making a real impact. And I think that's been shown today in this meeting as well. So well done. That's fantastic. Uh, I mean, I've already seen through the work that Keys has done, we've got we've got an approach that we'll be taking to EMT on reverse mentoring that Keys has led on. We've got the, the week that we've, we've talked about and, and Keys has been successful in getting us a new chair for the LGBT network, staff network group, which didn't have a chair at that particular point in time. So some real tangibles have been done and put in place in a really short space of time so brilliant stuff Keith. well done keep keep going at it thanks for your work on the re on the report and i know that the the board and workforce committee will be um will want to and, and em embrace having regular updates on that so thank you thank you thanks steve thanks uh Keza. it's been great to get to know you so far and do some work with you and there'll be more of that in the future uh good luck with your uh event at 12 o'clock it's part of national inclusion week i understand isn't it yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> thanks, Kiza. Thank you. Um, and uh, thanks for the report. And uh, just double check something. We are receiving and approving this report. So does this report receive everybody's approval? Excellent. There we are. Great. Thank you very much, colleagues. So we will now go back to uh, item 15, the COVID-19 booster vaccination programme. Uh, Michael. Thank you, Chair. I think all the information is there on the sheet. Um, the comms are going to go out either today or tomorrow. They'll be out. Um, just to mention about the booster COVID vaccination, um, I've mentioned Spike Wax there, which is the Moderna version, but it, it could be possible that we get the Pfizer version, uh, which is the Comirnaty. So that, that's that's the only thing. Um, the spike wax is what is being delivered by uh, GPs and by York at this point in time. Um, other than that, I have nothing else to say. Uh, the flu vaccines will be delivered come Monday. The vaccinations are going to start from the 4th of October, that's Tuesday, and they'll be through prior vaccinators, various sites. Again, the comms uh, will be going out shortly. So um, the only <clears throat> uh, issue that we probably are going to have is about encouraging people to report if they have had their vaccines uh, administered outside our organization to make um, to ensure that uh, they, they report back to us. A series of webinars have been organized as well by the pharmacy team to, to encourage people to kind of uh, participate and to do if they have any further questions to, to come back to us in addition to the comms that are going to go out. Um, so I'll I'll stop there and uh, okay. happy to take any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that update. Any questions to Michael, please? No? OK, thank you. I'm sure we'll get report backs on how it's going at, uh, at future uh, for meetings, but hopefully people will take the opportunity to have the vaccine. So we we'll move on to oh, item. Thank you, Chair. Um, may I be just a bit cheeky? I'm so sorry. I saw Dr. Kadri there in, in our oh. attendees who is doing the he's the guardian of safe working. And I'm really, really sorry. I know he's a busy clinician, so I'm just sort of. So what? Well, hang on. Are you, so do you want we to, us to take that number twenty one? Number twenty one, yeah. if it's possible. Okay, let's um, do to that. Is Oliver just before we go? Say, is Oliver okay? Because he's on earlier as well. Is Oliver around? 
Oliver? He's not joined yet, but I think he'll be watching. He'll be watching and he'll know and, and we'll team up. So he'll be fine. OK, that's fine then. So if we could go to item 21, Dr Mo Quadri, um, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank goodness for that. <laughs> Doctor, Doctor, would you like to introduce your report, please? Thank you on safe working. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Mo Kadri. I'm the guardian for safe working. I also work as the consultant forensic psychiatrist and medical psychotherapist for inpatient services at the personality disorder unit at the Humber Centre. Um, so just uh, the report is a positive report. Um, there was only the one issue, I suppose, um, that came up in my uh, exploration of this issue, which was the delay in the rotor being issued uh, for the junior doctors. And when inquiring about that, it turned out to be an issue of a structural nature from uh, Health Education England. Um, I think they found some difficulty with the, the real world mechanics of collecting the data, what trainees were, were going to start, when they were going to start, and providing accurate data to um, to our medical uh, workforce team. So I think there was a delay there. Um, but other than that, um, it's been a good uh, progressive year. We've had quite a number of positive changes. Um, so again, when you look at the data, there's been a number of uh, low exceptions, and that's been sustained over the past three years when you look at the data. There's not been any serious incidents pertaining to the trainees. There have not been any uh, exceptions re raised in relation to the educational access for the trainees. Um, I attend the junior doctor meeting, and there's a very collaborative approach here at the Humber Trust where if there are issues, we can very quickly contact the relevant parties and they're quite happy to come down and discuss these issues. Um, and the issue that was uh, outstanding from last year, which was the rest facilities, that's being resolved now. So the junior doctors have got a, a very good uh, rest space now based at the heart of where the on-calls are, uh, are stationed. So they've got adequate rest facilities now. So that's been resolved. Um, so just moving forward, I think we would just want to build upon the culture and practice that's been adopted for the past, you know, few years and just build upon that. Um, and I think the number of exceptions being raised, I think, comes down to a number of reasons. One of them is I think the teaching and education that's offered on a Wednesday morning and it's very well attended, where they go through on-call scenarios such as seclusion reviews, rapid tranquilization, and um, holding powers, mental health acts. We have clinicians like Dr. Ward offering seclusion teaching and rapid tranquilization. We have the um, Mental Health Act office that come and uh, give refreshes on the Mental Health Act and how to implement fa Section 5.2. So all things that you might ordinarily experience as a trainee on call that might create anxiety and create stress. They've got these kind of uh, kind of bolt on sessions or teaching sessions that ameliorate that anxiety. And then that translates to uh, better on calls because they're not uh, mopping up you know, spending two hours trying to resolve a Section 5.2 issue because they've got the training, they've got that experience, and they've got a uh, good network so they can ask these questions. So what we've noticed is that the number of exceptions raised, uh, um, there's a pattern, and, it, and the pattern, there's no structural pattern, but it's 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 more to do with exceptional on-call. So if you have a, a clinical acute activity, then you might get an exception raised and that's usually you know very it's quite it's quite a rare event for the trust we would like those acute clinical activities to happen between nine to five but you can't obviously predict that but on the whole there's not any structural issues um, and there there's quite a lot of um, uh, data to suggest that actually by implementing this training the, the exception should remain low uh, moving forward um, so in, in terms of what we'd like to focus on next year is to try and resolve this issue in relation to rotors being issued and what we've suggested and medical workforce are happy is to meet with the junior doctors, attend their meetings to uh, identify early if there are going to be any difficulties and to see if they, we can work together to kind of resolve those issues. It's always going to be, I suppose, like I said before, difficulties with the real world and the high, you know, high entropy and lots of chaos and change and then trying to create a an ordered, uh, you know, stable rotor. We're always going to have issues that come up, for example, maternity leave or trainees uh, withdrawing or sickness, but we're going to try and bring the two parties together at an early stage to try and resolve that moving forward. 
Thank, thanks very much. Um, I, I, as a guardian, you've really got a grip on this area and uh, and and focusing on the the issue that's most um, I suppose in it, most causing the, the the blips, the problems in the system. And you know, and uh, so, but thank you very much for that report. Um, I'm going to take Dean first, please, Dean. Yeah, thank you, and uh, and th and thank you, Mo. Um, I, although this is the annual report that we get here at the uh, the board, uh, just to update the board that we do get regular uh, updates through the workforce committee uh, from Mo, and uh, really appreciate the work that he does on that. And as people have just seen from this meeting, the um, you know the diligence in which he sort of approaches this work is very much appreciated. Uh, and as he said, that you know some of the stuff in terms of those uh, those rotors is stuff that's out with his or the organisation's uh, uh, ability to change. So um, uh, some of that does come through the the work that Health Education England do in terms of trying to get those doctors assigned to the appropriate places at the right time. And uh, as Mo was saying, it's not that's not always possible in in the real world. But uh, but thanks once again, Mo, for your support on this. Thank you, uh, Dean. Um, I've got um, uh, Steve. Uh, thanks, Caroline. Yeah, again, um, thanks. I just echo some of the comments that have already been made. Uh, it's a really adult conversation that takes place in the LNC. And I think Mo's mentioned that, you know, we do try and sort those issues out. It's very respectful. Things get done, things get sorted out. And I think what's coming through when we see the reports is hopefully the fruits of some of those conversations that that Dr. Dr. Michael's led in those particular meetings. So it's great to see. It's good to, to pick up. Hopefully, I think we are picking up some of those issues if they happen at an early stage. So hopefully they don't turn into anything major. So um, long, long may that continue, Caroline. <laughs> thank you, Steve. And I've got Hanif and then I've got Michael. Hanif. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gowdery, for uh, that very detailed report. Uh, maybe slightly pedantic, but it says recommendations um, and, the, and the six great recommendations. But, but do they actually translate then into to an actual work plan? And, and, and how would that be monitored? And, and sort of the feedback to us probably via the, um, the committees that Dean's just alluded to. Yeah, um, I suppose what I was uh, what I'm really focused on is sustainability and making sure that this is uh, you know, continues and progresses and develops. And I suppose, I think the last speaker was talking about um, culture, and I think that's uh, what I would like to focus on. So the recommendations are predominantly those kind of issues about resolving issues at a very early stage and it, putting those things in place. So uh, even if one part doesn't work, it should still still it should, it should still function. So the peer support, the reflective spaces, these are all to do with kind of cultural practice. And I think creating the way we talk about it, the way we introduce it, the way we kind of highlight it in the recommendations reinforces the value of those things. Um, so I think th that's the reason why I put them in the recommendations, just to kind of highlight that this is the, that's where the approach is going to be, that's where the focus is going to be, and the fruits will come out in the, in terms of the data when we look at that, with which we've seen in the past two years anyway. Thanks, Mo. Michael, and thanks to you, Michael, for leading on this area as well. Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to Dr. Kadri. I think uh, um, Dean has answered most of the things that I wanted to say about the delay from Health, Health Education England in the uh, lists, lists coming down to us. Uh, and going back to Hanif's point about recommendations, this report will uh, go to the training committee as well, who will then look at all the recommendations that have been made. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, work anyway, so that will be picked up uh, at that time. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Mo. Excellent work once again. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll move on now then. I think we'll move on to um, if Rosie Rosie is here already, Rosie O'Connell, item 22, which is the safeguarding annual report. Uh, and then we'll go back to the agenda whilst Rosie's here and, um, and proceed as normally. Rosie, are you there? <laughs> Hang on. She no. was watching. She was watching the streaming, so she she should hopefully uh, pick up that you're. Hello, Rosie. Or oh, we'll come back. OK, we'll come back. OK, we'll go back to the agenda and cost of living and support report. Michelle. 
Yes, thanks, Chair. Just let me get the right page. Um, this, first of all, I thank my colleagues because this is a combination report. It's not one necessarily that I've, I've completely authored. We've tried to pull together. And it, it's more just a, a general start, really, um, of a future conversations that we'll be having at the strategic elements of the board meeting that we're doing, like emerging thoughts. So we wanted just to give you a bit of an overview around the cost of living because we mention it a lot. We've mentioned it in the board a lot in relationship to what we're doing. So we've tried to pull together a little bit of an overview, quite succinctly, I hope, about what we've been doing. Because we've been doing work, especially in relationship to staff health and wellbeing support, for a long time, actually. Um, and obviously, we've continued to do that. And we talk about this regularly at the executive meetings with staff. And we're constantly asking staff about how they're feeling and what else we can be doing alongside, and again, I thank my colleagues, my exec colleagues, looking at what other organisations are doing. And I don't think we're an outlier. I think we've got some really good practice here that we know others are copying, such as working from home allowance, etc. So I'm not going to go through it in detail, Chair, if that's OK, because I think it, it, hopefully the report speaks for itself. Just to really point out that we are still an anchor organisation, so we're still employing locally as we as much as we can. Obviously, the apprenticeship piece links into that as well that we've we've been talking about a lot in relationship to really identifying and and, and promoting um, uh, apprenticeships across the organisation. The impossible the. Uh, responsible employer is contained in here with the staff health and well-being piece but also importantly which we've tried to capture some of the way we're supporting our patients who will be um, in some of the most vulnerable groups um, and we talk about health inequality so for me the action is really important rather than just the rhetoric and talking about it so what are we actually doing to help our communities and our patients so there's a little bit in there and we will look at doing more than, more than that we can so it is reviewed regularly we do have regular conversations at the executive management team and Lynn man manages it through the health and well-being group from a staff point of view so it's a bit of an overview just to start the conversation I've maybe not here chair I would suggest we take it into one of our deeper sessions where and we've got a lot more time to give it a lot more of that that detailed conversation but anything in, immediate people want me to take away more than happy to and i'm sure my colleagues will happily uh, add to to any of the narrative thanks um thanks very much uh, michelle and this is the start of a conversation um that we're going to be having over the months uh, months ahead um any comments to michelle no okay thank you very much that is uh, noted um, we move on to item 17, which is a paper by myself around proposals for our board meetings and actually going back to what Michelle just said, where we where we create space to have those more strategic in-depth discussions about certain issues as well, like the cost of living affecting our staff and our, our patients as well. So the report that's before you, it is actually to approve. It isn't for information and note, as, as it says on the uh, agenda. And basically, it's come out, as you all know, from discussions we've had at board timeouts over the last year about how we do make sure that, first and foremost, it's paramount to show that we are an open organisation that our assurance and governance procedures are very clear and robust, but also to make sure that we can balance the time we give to our formal board meetings like this one, but also to those opportunities as a board to discuss in more depth some of the strategic and issues that are arising that don't necessarily fit within a, a formal board framework. And so this this the proposal is that we will move from 2023 to six formal board meetings a year, and that will be interleaved with six um, board strategic sessions as well. Now, I know that one of the issues is about concern about how we will therefore deal with in those alternate months issues that really should be decided at board level. So again, within the report, it explains how we will ensure that at those board strategic sessions, if there are items that come up that need to be escalated for board approval, we will create the space to do that at those sessions. But also the formal board board meetings will have an influence on what we actually go to discuss at those strategic uh, board sessions as well. And within the um, report, there's a sort of flow chart, I suppose, showing how that will happen. Um, all the board have been consulted on this and thank you so much for your input into this. Uh, we will have a review after six months. Uh, so that will be around June 2023, June, July 2023, to make sure all our um, expectations uh, are being met and we can satisfy that um, this is a robust model for our government insurance. 
It doesn't affect the subcommittees that are already an important part of what we do. They will still feed in to both the board, but also those strategic discussion sessions as well. Um, and again, chairs will be thinking about their timetabling, how they will be doing their assurance reports to fit with this new model. Um, but I think actually, I think it is. I think we've come to a point where this is probably the right balance we want to make here, and, and to make sure that we are having those in depth as well as those insurance assurance type discussions at formal boards as well. So um, I won't say much more because I think we've all been through it. But for the public looking in, I just want to ensure all of them that we've really thought through this process. Uh, there will be checks and balances within it as well, and there will be a review after six months. So. Um, um, without further ado, any questions before I seek approval on this? No, thank you very much. Um, is are the recommendations in this report approved? Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Um, really appreciate all your efforts for, on this piece of work. OK, we now move on then to um, item 18, Board Assurance Framework. We have Oliver and that's followed up by item 19, the Risk Register. So um, uh, we'll probably couple these together, I think. Uh, Oliver. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you um, <laughs> for facilitating my attendance this morning. Um, so the board assurance framework for today um, obviously covers off the period for quarter two of 22-23. Um, following approval of the trust strategy in July, we have done some initial work just uh, obviously replacing the trust strategic objectives uh, with the newly agreed set and we've aligned the existing risks uh, to those objectives. So that is clear and, and present in the version that you've got today. Um, obviously, it's a fairly big task to undertake a full review. Uh, of all of those objectives. So we'll be continuing that work into quarter three um, with a view to take all of uh, sort of the assessed risks or any new risks that have been identified in quarter against those objectives uh, to the relevant board subcommittees, obviously based on where they align to the Board Assurance Framework document, just to involve obviously those committees as part of that process as well, just to allow them obviously feedback and comment. Um, and ultimately, just to reflect today that although obviously it is a full review for quarter two, has been for obviously the board subcommittees and for your executive management team, there is still some further work to undertake in line with the, the strategy work across the organisation. Um, also, we'll link in with any sort of performance metrics work that's going to be undertaken, any gaps analysis of um, any performance data that we need, and hopefully then we'll start to triangulate that more and feed that into uh, the board assurance framework as well going forward. So I think it's a positive step in the right direction, obviously has been for a full level of review. Um, assurance um, ratings have remained fairly static, but we'd expect that obviously because we haven't done that sort of significant piece of work just yet. Uh, but I anticipate we might see some change, obviously, as we go into quarter three and as we sort of fully refresh the suite of risks um, that are aligned to the document. So um, I think what we were seeking for today was sort of confirmation that the, the board were comfortable with that, that process and that way forward. Um, and obviously any feedback or any comments at this stage would be valuable as well, obviously, as we take those into next quarter's review uh, and take them through the subcommittees early in the quarter. So I think that's um, probably enough sort of grounding to... Uh, present it. So I think I'll hand over to yourselves for any queries or any comments. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you very much. Stuart. Yeah, morning, Oliver. Hi. Uh, yeah, morning. very well. well welcome to what you're doing on it. It's just to, to link, make a link to a earlier part of our conversation this morning and the uh, where we're seeing an increase in delayed transfers of care. I, I was thinking through where would that hit the BAF? It might hit it in a number of ways. I'm not asking you to answer that now, but I have to think about it in undertaking that further review because it's a fairly cross-cutting theme that could affect our overall performance and assurance. So I just wanted to make that link for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Francis. Mine's very minor, Oliver. It's, I, I know it's difficult to update absolutely everything. I've just picked up on goal five. It still says maximising instead of optimising. Mine, very minor. Thank you, Francis. Apologies, I'm not sure that was overlooked, but we'll make sure that's fully updated. Thank you. It's easy to miss them. There's loads of them in there. Are we picking up the risk register now, or is that coming next? Yeah, uh, I can, can I just just check something? Are we are, are we in the doc, in the report? You say we're asked to um, uh, consider and approve. Are we approving this, or just noting it, or are we seeking approval? I think essentially we we need it approved for the quarter's Fine. end. Okay, um, all so right then. You, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks very much. Um, so, um, is that uh, can we seek approval for this? Um, for the board assurance framework proposals. Thank you so much. Let's move on to the risk register. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you. So 
the Trust World Risk Register document obviously details the current risks for the organisation, which are scored at 15 or above, and obviously have been through review process via EMT um, and have been accepted at that rating. Um, what I mean by accepted, obviously, we're not accepting the risks, but obviously they've been approved at that rating and being managed as such on that document. Um, obviously, we continue to report the risks to the relevant board subcommittees based on the, the content. So, obviously, quality committees do review any quality related risks across the organisation, workforce, or any workforce related finance and so on. Um, in terms of the composition of the risk register, obviously we've got the three workforce related risks for organisational, uh, some of our hard to recruit areas. So that's our retention and recruitment of qualified nurses and then the recruitment and retention of GPs, which are both carried over from the previous quarter, but still represent some significant risk to the organisation. Um, risk 224 in relation to overarching financial position, but specifically the impact of agency spend, uh, which has replaced the previous overarching finance risk. Um, OPS 11, which addresses overall waiting times within the organisation and potential safety and quality impact. And then OPS 13, which is specific in relation to our CAMS inpatient position and obviously then associated impact linked to that. So those risks are carried over. Um, I anticipate as we do the full review, we may tweak some of those entries just to make them sort of link in with the objectives quite clearly. I think those risks still remain coming into the quarter, obviously uh, significant, as I mentioned, challenges for the organisation. Um, in terms of the sort of breakdown month on month, unfortunately, I've noticed that there is some some errors in the actual uh, table of the report, which I will need to update and recirculate. Um, it's in terms of the overall number. Um, it has gone up to 183, not 182. And in the composition for the red rated risk is three at 15, three at 16. So uh, apologies for that. That was a, an error when it's been pulled across from our Excel document. So we'll, we'll update the document and circulate that for any additional comment. Um, but in terms of obviously the position, um, I hate to say static because the risks are being reviewed sort of continuously through their life cycle and their process. Obviously, the actions and controls continue to be updated and reflective of the current work that we're doing. Um, we've also included on the cover sheet for this version of the report uh, an update just to provide some additional assurance around the wider context and the wider works from each of the exec leads for those risks. And that's included on the front sheet as well. And I think that's something that we'll continue to do, which I think um, was discussed quite quite robustly at EMT when we last reviewed the document, I think just provides that additional level of assurance. So um, I think overall, fairly positive for the organisation. We'll still obviously continue to escalate risks as required from our divisional and direct at risk registers through the trust ODG meeting um, and anything that does come through with a score of 15 is robustly sort of reviewed and critiqued. Um, if we feel as though obviously those scores do maintain at 15, they do get included. But I think we do obviously take quite a, a lot of interest in those risks and make sure they're adequately scored. So some risks that do get escalated on, on balance when we're looking at it from an organisational perspective are getting regraded around sort of 12 and 10 marks. But obviously then they go through a sort of robust confirm and challenge via ODG and then continued review via the sort of local divisional processes as well so i think the process you know is ever evolving ever changing um but i think this is good sort of position and reflection of where we're at currently uh, for the highest rated risks within the organization thanks very much um oliver and i think the summary on the front sheets are really helpful um you know that they, they really it's a really good summary really helpful and are good highlights thank you for that and the emt for that any questions to um oliver on the risk register uh francis as you say, great work, really detailed, evolving well. My only side question is in the detail bit where you've got the gaps in control and then the additional actions. I'm, I'm not sure that on all of them, the additional actions address the gaps in the control. Uh, I think it needs a bit more consistency. So, for example, on um, WFO4, the two gaps are trust-wide workforce plan delivery and formalised band five nurse career development provision. And the actions are about talk before you walk. So that they don't relate to the two issues that you've raised and how we address them. And, and there's yeah. a few, if you work your way through, there's a few of those. Mm. I'll, I'll take that on board. Thank you, Francis. I'll pick that up with the relevant risk leads. And I think obviously we'll address that as part of the that comprehensive review work for the quarter as well, going into early quarter three. So I'll make sure those are addressed and I'll uh, provide a full update when this next comes as well around what we've done, specifically looking at those gaps and actions. But thank you for raising that. Yeah, there might be just a little slip up where people have cut and paste something and just the read across doesn't make quite sense. But yeah, eagle-eyed Francis Patton there. Thank you for that, Francis. Um, okay, any other questions? No, I can't see anybody. 
Oliver, thank you very much. And thank you for waiting today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. See you later. Thanks, thank Oliver. you. Thank you. OK, so we now move on to uh, item 22. Rosie O'Connell, who's here for the Safeguarding Annual Report. Thank you, Chair, and apologies uh, for earlier on. Don't uh, worry, I, it was my fault. I thought you might be there. I caught you on the hop. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I'm just, I'm just here to give you a sort of an overview of uh, our annual report for 2021-22. Um, hopefully you've all had the chance to, to read that. Um, so I think that the key sort of takeaway and an issue um, in this report is the increase in um, I suppose demand of our safeguarding team for safeguarding support, but increasing safeguarding activity across the trust and across the region. So working with our partners, um, just to give you an example of that, which you will see in the report there, we've had increases in a lot of our multi-agency safeguarding meetings, such as MARAC, which is for medium and high risk domestic abuse cases. We've seen an increase of 34 uh, percent. MACE, which is our multi-agency child exploitation meeting, an increase of 15 and also with prevent which is the um sort of strategy in place to prevent people from becoming radicalized into terrorism we've seen increases of 40 contacts on that so um we really are across regionally and nationally um which looking at trends we are seeing that increase in safeguarding activity there so for us as a safe as a service and a team it, it's been a challenge over the last year to respond to that um that's included increasing our staffing levels and, and the way in which we work I will say um, one of the, I guess, it seems wrong, but the positive of COVID going to virtual is, is meaning that we have been more present as a team. So we've been able to get in touch with more of our teams, attend more safeguarding meetings and be able to offer that support in a timely manner. So that's actually been a benefit to us and, and probably does contribute to why we're seeing an increase in the numbers hitting our, our safeguarding team for support there. But yeah, we're certainly we're seeing that. Um, another thing which I think is quite interesting to mention is the uh, modern slavery element of this so it's, it's something that doesn't often feature nationally within the safeguarding figures but following on uh, from the ukraine russia war um, we have been more involved with our local authority partners um, in, in providing sort of uh, information and support for for those who do need mental health support so we're seeing ukraine refugees come over here and unfortunately some of them are being exploited and there's a really good system around them to support them um, and we as a trust are involved with that system and, and, and are providing that sort of signposting to make sure that those who are being exploited are given the right support. Um, so, so that's something we have seen over the last year as well. Um, in terms of achievements, you'll see um, we've done a lot. Um, you know, despite the demands, we have done a lot. And, I'm, and one of the key achievements I do want to mention is, is the White Ribbon accreditation and the work that the Trust has done as a domestic abuse. Um, and I will mention our, our practitioner, Sally Bainbridge, who does lead on this because she's done a lot of work for it. Um, we, as you know, were the first health trust to become White Ribbon accredited, which is something we're really proud of. Um, and last year it was our year two. We're moving into year three. We've done a lot of work across White Ribbon and domestic abuse as a whole um, over the last year, and that includes um, updating the policy to reflect the Domestic Abuse Act 2021. We've introduced um, routine and targeted inquiry, which is where if patients are coming in, we're asking those questions about domestic abuse to make sure and give them that opportunity to, to make a disclosure and, and for us to, to, to help them. Um, so that's been introduced and it was launched in July of this year. So we're still at the early stages, but I think that's a really important um, factor. We've been working really closely with our, our HR departments and, and just looking not only at our patients, but how we support our staff group as well. Um, you know, we, we do have staff who have been victims um, of domestic abuse and, and there may be staff members who may be worried about being perpetrators of domestic abuse. So we're really trying to be that inclusive trust, not only looking at patients but, but staff and how we support them so we, we produce a lot of guidance and another HR team have, have amended that within their policies so it's a really really good piece of work that we're leading for we've got um, awareness campaigns and posters coming up there as well and we've got a lot more planned for year three into the into the white ribbon um, process as well um, another area that we've been focusing on is the uh, child neglect so um, we're, we're, I'm really pleased to say that some of our practitioners are now trained in uh, graded care profile training, which is a, a special tool to, to look at child neglect and, and assess that. Um, we're working really closely with our partners in delivering that, not only 
um, to, to our own trust staff, which is really important that we can pick up on that child neglect and respond, but also to, to other local authorities and our health colleagues as well. This is something that will go forward for, for many years, thinking about the cost of living crisis, because as we do know, post-COVID and looking at the cost of living crisis, the, the risk um, of child neglect sadly does increase. Um, it may not be intentional, but we know that that's going to feature and I um, and, and my, um, the safeguarding nurse, um, Kerry Bowen, we are pretty certain that we're going to see increasing numbers of that over the next year. Um, so it's a really good achievement there and, and, and obviously please take a look at the report and, and in there. I will mention as well training. Um, you may be aware that we've, we've reviewed the training package and, and I know it's been a, a concern in terms of the level three training compliance for our trust uh, for adults and children. Because of that, we have reviewed the training and I'm really pleased to say that we are seeing month by month increases now for the trust. And this is something um, that the Humber and North Yorkshire Health and Care Partnership are recognising as well when we have our quarterly meetings. So we're in a strong position now. And the report there, I think we were around the uh, 62 for adults and 66 for children. We're now in the 70s. So we, we, we're continuing to see that. So I hope that gives you some assurances that that's a good piece of work and we're, we're getting to those levels. Um, and then in terms of moving forward, as we've touched on already, um, post-COVID, that, that recovery, you know, we're still seeing patients who are have been impacted by the lockdown, um, you know, particularly children who, um, you know, through, through disruption of education, they have, you know, had a significant impact on their mental health and risk of abuse. Um, we've also got the cost of living crisis there, which we think is fairly more. So we are going to target our new safeguarding strategy, which is due at the end of the year, and look at the risk of neglect, the risk of self-neglect and, and how we as a service can be preventative. So how can we get in there um, before before this abuse happens and this neglect happens? So that for us as a service and as a team means that we want to start getting back into those units and being uh, more present with, with not only our staff team, but with our patients as well, because that's as much as we've been able to get out to other people on teams, the negative aspect of COVID is that we haven't been in their units as much. And so we really want to focus on getting back in with our patients and, and pushing that preventative work there. Um, I'll stop there because I'm aware of the time, Chair, but if anyone's got any questions on the report, I'll gladly take them. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Rosie. And it's a really good report. It's very readable. I like the I very much like the, what we said and what we did. Uh, chart at the end that's really helpful as well to sort of direct you to certain areas um, of focus so thank you very much for your work and others on this. Uh, Dean. Yeah thanks Chair and thanks uh, uh, Rosie I agree uh, really clear sort of update on the uh, annual uh, report it was just picking up on the mandatory training in terms of that further assurance so um, colleagues will have seen uh, earlier in the report on the performance report that in all us mandatory training that we're above our target but we do have a look at the workforce committee for those areas within that that we're not and safeguarding has been one of those and so great to see that progress being made and we have asked for a, a trajectory in the workforce committee about when we will get back to compliance on that area so we can monitor that uh, closely as well but really good to see those updates that have been received there the, the second uh, thing, Chair, was just a, a broader comment, really, which is, I guess this is a report in how we've been responding to that rising uh, incidence of safeguarding uh, coming through and um, whether this should signal to us about whether there's something as a as a board we need to be flagging up those sorts of rising number of cases, given the circumstances that we're in. And I don't know whether that's in the nature of you know, a letter from yourself to uh, MPs or to ministers to be saying we're noticing this and you know some of this is driven by resource allocation isn't it nationally and things as well so it's just uh, uh you know uh, being a responsible partner not only doing what we can to respond with the resources we've got but also flagging up that we're noticing it and i suppose if others are noticing it then there's the opportunity for people to do something about it at source thanks thank Dean. You. I think that's, thanks Dean. i think that's a really uh, good idea michelle and i perhaps we can talk about that and take that away it's, it, it chimes as well with the delayed transfers issue as well to make sure that people are conscious that within our area of the NHS we also struggle in that area as well um, uh, too. Thank you for that, that's really helpful. Uh, Steve. Uh, thanks, thanks Caroline, thanks Rosie, really good report. Um, just just a couple of things just to, to highlight really um, <clears throat> and just to put some data to, to Dean's uh, notice really around the, the training. So I, I just had a quick look while you were talking Rosie, I think you've increase those figures from 59% to 72%, 56% to 69% in the past 12 months. So uh, well done on that real shift. I think it shows that we 
talk about it in workforce committee we do some things that trajectory is all going in the right direction so i think there's some real positivity around that uh, and just the other um, thing rosie just to pick up you mentioned around the kind of domestic abuse and and our staff and and, and uh, i'd absolutely um echo some of your concerns and what can we do about that um just to can i can i ask you to maybe have a conversation with gary jennison who's the new lead for our staff um well-being training because one of the i know one of the things that gary's thinking of doing is putting some support groups in around that for our staff so i think your link into that rosie and your experience would be really good so um just a, a conversation there and i think your experience will help enhance what our offer could be to staff around that so thank you thanks Jeff. thanks steve uh michelle yeah, no, thank you. I think Jim makes a great point about about raising that, and I'm happy to to take it forward with you, Caroline. But just I think just on behalf of the board, I mean, I know I've said this before, Rosie, but um, you know, given the the, the the massive increases in in numbers coming through in demand, I mean, I know you've had a small increase in in capacity, but we've also taken on board a, a, you know, a big a big service in Hull in relationship to the ISPIN service, which you remember is the health visit to school nursing, etc. So there is a huge increase in workload other, other than what you've mentioned in here. So on behalf of the board, I want to say thank you to the team because I know it's not easy, especially in your role doing that blended approach either because of the cases that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and I know that you've got that working really quite well and really quite nicely now which is great but just on behalf of the board just say thank you so much for the work that you're doing and the differences that you're making as well because I see the differences when I go out and do some of the visits as well so thank you. Thank you Michelle. Ditto. Thank you very much, uh, Rosie. And of course, this report has also been to obviously the EMT and the Quality Committee as well. So um, it's it's really good that it's being uh, uh, being seen within the system, as well as the point Dean made about aspects of this coming to workforce as well. Um, it's uh, it, that's really important to see that happening. Thank you, Rosie, so much. Thank you for your patience today and have a great day and the rest of the week. Thanks very much. OK, then let us. Move. Oh, actually, we have to ratify the Safeguarding Anna report. Is that ratified by everybody? Yeah, great. OK, thank you. So next on um, to Framework of Quality Assurance for Responsible Officers. Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will be very brief. I think the paper says it all. We as an organisation which employs doctors need to have a process in place for annual appraisal and every five years a recommendation or not for revalidation and we are expected to have a responsible officer and have all the structures and processes in place. And this is a report that I need to send to uh, NHS England after sign off from Michelle saying that yes, all the processes are in place and we are running um, as, as we should be. And I think uh, uh, as I said, as, as is mentioned in the report, I think we, we have been meeting with all the requirements, even though in spite of the uh, pandemic, there were some uh, delays, but we are still keeping to uh, schedule and time. So um, if if the board is happy with that, we I, I can uh, ask Michelle to sign it off later and we can send it off, please. Thank you very much. Any questions, Steve, or comments, Steve? I, we saw this at EMT, so no, no, you know, very happy with the content of it. I think it's just one of those that would benefit coming in through Workforce Committee if we can get the timelines to work for it in future years. I know it's often a scheduling thing, but I think it'd be useful to have it if we can try and do that. But I know we got it at uh, EMT, very happy with the content. Point noted. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can we just make sure that on the worksheet, it's, it's logged that it's been through EMT, it's not in the box on the back. So if we could just make sure that's there, that'd be really helpful. Um, thank you. OK, uh, so th we receive a note that no other questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Moving on then to 24, Michelle. Just take myself off mute. Yes, this is just a regular report that we said that we'd bring here just to give the board a bit of an update in relationship to what's happening in the Mental Health Collaborative particularly. Alison sends her apologies um, today, so I'm just going to pick it up. I'm not going to go through the report because hopefully people have had a chance to read it and I'm just conscious of time. Just gives you a lot of the outline of the work underway. This is across the system, not just within our organisation. Um, nothing to escalate from our perspective, from a board point of view, and certainly getting some very positive feedback in relationship to the work that Mental Health and Learning Disability Collaborative is doing across the piece. But hopefully just sets that where we're up to with the programme um, and just gives you a bit of an update. I think the board said they wanted to receive it regularly, so we'll continue to do that, Chair. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Michelle. Any questions? 
No, thank you. That's received and noted. Moving on then to the assurance report. Stuart, uh, Charitable Funds Committee, please. Uh, thank you. You've got a couple of reports uh, from this committee. Uh, we've met twice since the board last met. And we've got a paper coming up from Steve in a minute on the KPI. So very briefly, um, uh, we've got and we've also got a meeting this, this afternoon, the part two discussion about some of the options going forward. We've got a kind of a continued mixed performance against the KPIs. Uh, and we know that we've got work to do to improve overall performance on the financials uh, in specifically. Um, in our in our meetings, we had some very constructive discussions, though, with the fund zone managers. Uh, we quizzed them on what they're doing to um, to utilise the funds that have already been raised in the different uh, parts of the, the geography. Um, and we've also got, which I think is a, a really good uh, outcome, we've got a, wor a working list now of um, essentially f potential future campaigns uh, which will continue to develop. Uh, so more to do, but I think the, the key discussion comes in our meeting uh, after this one on future options. So I will stop there on charitable funds. OK, thanks very much. Any questions to Stuart on, on this? There's two reports there. No. OK, thank you. I think they're both received and noted. Yeah. OK, uh, over to you, Steve. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, so um, Stuart sort of trailed this in. So we um, there was a request from the board to revisit the KPIs in the Charitable Funds Committee, which the Charitable Funds Committee did at that time. Um, I know there was a number of really uh, good suggestions that were made, uh, particularly some, Francis, I know that you'd made a couple there. I think the long and the short of the conversation was there's some really good points in this, and this is due an, a, 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 an overhaul. I think it's fair to say, and I think everybody felt that it was more of a timing issue. And I think the the committee, and I can see Stuart nodding, the committee felt the timing to do that was linked to that second conversation that we're going to have in part two. So um, for the purposes of this, Caroline, I would suggest that the, the well, the recommendation of the committee was we keep it as it is for the time being, but we 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 look at that again uh, very early in the new year, and we can probably expand on that a little bit more in part two if that's helpful. No, that's really helpful. I think it's great to know that the conversation has been had and the discussion's been had. I know it's been had in a great deal of depth as well. Um, and that assurance about the direction of travel and, and where we go is really helpful to that too. So unless uh, there are any... That Sorry, and sorry, that assurance sorry, that you know it wasn't it wasn't um you know they weren't we haven't disregarded those comments no, that no. were made in previously you know that very much they're kept and they're working they're working so I wouldn't want you know wouldn't want that impression to be taken away certainly. No, 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 absolutely. I think you read the reports in in the timeline, you can see how the conversation has developed. So I'm I'm reassured by that most definitely. Um, okay, thank you very much. So I think we're ratifying this report from yourself, Steve. Uh, today. That's what it says in the box. That's correct. So if people are happy with the, the the explanation of both Stuart and Steve and ratifying Steve's report, item 26. Yep. Great. Lovely. Thank you very much. We move on then to Quality Committee Assurance Report. Uh, now, Mike, are you going to be doing this or Philip? Yeah, I think it should be me because it was, uh, it was okay. my meeting. Yeah, I, hand okay. over, I hand over tomorrow. If Just check in. Um, Take the report as read, and you'll see from the report in the decisions made, there's a number of policies and strategies that have come to this board that have been through quality committee. And there was um, one item of work underway about quality improvement and, and asking EMT uh, to just look at that and the commitment across divisions, which was a bit variable. And I'm assuming that's in hand. And so with that said, um, I present the assurance report to the board. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And quite a few things have come up today as well in terms of some of the items on the agenda. So thanks very much for that work. Any questions? No, that's uh, noted. Thank you very much. We move on then to Mental Health Ledge and that's you again, Mike. Yeah, again, take the, uh, take the paper as read. Um, and we've approved at the meeting the, the annual report to go to the board that will come up. Um, I, I think really nothing much that I want to want to say apart from the task and finish group once um, on increasing diversity of hospital managers and I've just seen a diary request for another meeting towards uh, the back end of October so that's work in progress. Thanks very much Mike any questions? No thank you very much that is noted 
audit committee assurance report Stuart yeah thank you um so we continue to be in really good shape on the audit front and much of our discussion in the committee is about fine tuning and pushing to that next level improvement starting from a very good base is, is what i'd say for this meeting um we had a very good deep dive in our last discussion into the community and primary care division risk register and once again good evidence that you know risk management is absolutely embedded in operational decision making which is great to hear um, I think the only thing to bring up today is that just to be aware that there's some national level work being commissioned about the financial health of the NHS, which will um, actually, unusually for us, kind of need us to revise a little bit of the deployment of our internal uh, audit force. Um, so we're comfortable with the explanation of that. Um, we're keeping an eye on the timing of that piece of work, but otherwise uh, nothing untoward to alert you to at this stage. Quite Thank the opposite. Thanks, Stuart. Any questions? No, thank you very much. That is noted. Uh, move on to the Collaborative Committee Assurance Report. Stuart. Yeah, and, and to complete my, uh, my pack, uh, so once again, a couple of couple of discussions since our, our last meeting. Um, we have decided within this committee to streamline the way we operate. So we've introduced a, a less frequent meeting, a more streamlined report to avoid some of the duplication, which I think is in keeping with our earlier discussion about streamlining our board arrangements. Uh, key issues you've noted in, in, in the report, again, about delayed transfers of care. Um, and on the plus side, um, I get the, the clear sense that each of the work streams continues to mature and um, we've got a kind of a good vision statement for each of the work streams. And specifically, as we've said before, uh, the um, episodes at the Schoen Clinic has given us some good pause for learning about uh, that issue. And we'll we'll play that into future deliberations as well. So, again, a positive report for you today. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, I can see no hands up. Thank you very much. And that report is noted. And items for escalation. Any items for escalation? No. Any other business? Michelle. Just a, just a quickie, Chair. Sorry, I should have briefed you. Sorry, I didn't it. But it's just to say that obviously this is Michelle Hughes's last committee meeting, uh, board meeting as well, uh, should I say. And I know that she's not here, but I just express my uh, thanks to Michelle on behalf of the board. We will see her at the time out, but just so it's in, it registered in the board, if we could, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, thanks very much, Michelle. Um, she's having uh, she's on holiday, having a dis well deserved rest, um, and uh, she's been hugely supportive to me in this last year. Uh, the sort of source of all knowledge on so many issues, um, and of course, she. I just like to, if we want to put it in the note, is particularly to thank her for how she um, really helped lead us all through the well led review earlier this year, and the amount of support she gave to all of us who took part in that. Uh, it was absolutely tremendous. And she really sort of held everything together in many respects. And 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 that was such a great service she did uh, for us and for the trust and the result spoke for itself. Um, so yes, thank you very much. Okay, so that is the end of the board meeting. I apologize profusely because I said we finished at 12.30 and it is now 12.46. Um, so I will think on that for the next board meeting. Um, and I think we should have, we'll stop here and then have half an hour break, come back at, say, about quarter past one for the part two. If